All right, I think we are ready. Um, start the meeting at 631. Uh, I'm up here, Roxbury Board of School Directors. Uh, to start with important business first. Last update, two to one, Montpelier. Uh, just a few minutes left. Um, hopefully we'll hear ecstatic cheering outside in just a matter of And Field minutes. Hockey and has congratulations oh, to field our field hockey, field hockey is moving on. Nice. Finals. Did the finals. Did the finals. Last final. last yes. Um, so also worth noting our cross country team came in two points okay. behind U32 for second place in states. Awesome. And our girls soccer lost in penalty kicks <laughs> last night. That was brutal. <laughs> yeah. Good game though. Yeah. It's really, really well fought. Yeah. Um, so public comment, uh, let's start with anyone in the room first, if you want to come up. Um. Uh, my name is Lisa Burns. I have had students in the system since 2012. Um, and I am here to urge all the school board members to vote no to track funding. Um, I feel there's been a lot of discussion about where the money comes from and, and that sort of thing. Any way you look at it, we have a large fund balance that can be spent. It can be spent one time. Each dollar can only be spent once. And I believe that spending $2 million and actually, since the time you got your bid, uh, building prices have gone up 14%, so we can just add another 300,000 so far. Um, spending that kind of money at this point in time is absolutely tone deaf to what's happening in our country with regard to education. And I think <coughs> our students deserve as much funding and time and materials and effort that anyone else does to make up for this educational loss that happened because of COVID. And no one, I, I assume that there is no one in this room who would deny that we have had horrible educational loss. So we have this block of money and it can be spent once. So anyone who says, this isn't an either or decision. You can have both. Either thinks they are speaking to a fool, or they are a fool themselves, or they just love that branding idea where you say what you want to be, I want to be everything, and then it doesn't matter. So it would be my hope that this money could be spent um, to help with what we've already very successfully done with three million or yeah three million dollars worth of ESSER funds, we have used them effectively, but they are obviously not even close to enough for what we need to do. Ms. Bone Steele is going to give us a talk about um, what we've done with it: kitchens, little gyms, interventionists, but it's not even close to enough for what our kids deserve and need. And given a choice of a track for $2 million or $2 million to fund education, I would ask you to do the right thing. That's it. Uh, I'm Jacob Nunnally. I'm a at Main Street Middle School and I think that track is really important for uh, the middle schoolers and the high schoolers that compete on it and I think that uh, overall it's less maintenance for the people because like last year when I did track and field uh, it took like an entire practice and a half to do it, and we didn't really get to practice before the meet. And also, I think that it prevents injury 
because last year there was a lot of skin knees uh, and like rocks and knees and it was kind of horrible but uh, I think we can fix that. Also I think it's important because uh, track and field would be more fun and uh, track cost less money and like uh, you can like you can choose what you want to do and I think not a lot of sports do that except for like uh, these and also it's it's uh, I guess like the coaches work really hard to keep us like in shape and if you've seen any other track from a school you would know that ours is nothing compared to any other track and I think we just need to realize that. So. So I'm Catherine Nunnally, I'm Jacob's mom, and um, I've been in education for over 20 years as a teacher and of course a parent, and now as a staff person here, and I just want to reiterate what Jacob said, and he came up with that pretty much all by himself, um, that what we need now is more than anything is community building, and track is one way that that can definitely be done. and. Um, just from his, you know, mental health and physical health, from all the things that we've lost with COVID, track and field and cross country have been a great way to improve all of that. And I just also want to reiterate that the coaches are excellent, and I think our facility should equal that excellence. And it is a sport that what, over 20% of the middle school participates in. It's a very inclusive sport. And I would like for the school board to support the new track. Thank you. Hey, folks. Jim Eikenberry. You've seen me before. You know I support the track. Just going to hit some highlights real quick, then make time, because I uh, appreciate you all making the time after a long work day. I was over 200 miles of driving today in most of uh, the northwest part of the state, so we'll keep it moving here. Um, <clears throat> So just reiterating what Jacob said and really here uh, in support of uh, my son, Simon, and his uh, classmates. And uh, I want to just talk about what I think track actually means and why the infrastructure makes sense. Um, the current track has been neglected for you know, decades. And that's not in keeping with how we maintain our school district. I think the report from Andrew last uh, school meeting was really clear that we are proactive, we are thoughtful about infrastructure, we maintain what we have, and we try to make it better. And that hasn't happened on the track facilities. The, the love and care that the athletic fields get is not what the track has received. Uh, parents, myself included, have spent untold hours picking grass out of the high jump and long jump trying to straighten bars and make lanes not be wet or icy, uh, painting lines you know, for the each track meet, measuring us, un untold hours of volunteer time because we love our kids and we love the sport and we love what it gives them for their mental health and their physical health and their emotional well-being and their community building. And I don't think other folks are mowing the lawns as parents or setting up all the goalposts as parents and breaking down afterwards. It's, you know, uh, we've given a lot, and we'd like to see some of our tax resources go towards improving the facility so that it is safe and that it is excellent and, you know, just something that can be used. I think it's an inclusive sport. I also think that it's not going to just benefit a few. I believe that not only will the track team use it, the cross country team, I think you're going to find other teams using it once it's a better, safer facility. Uh, gym classes, it's not unusual to take a lap around the track, stretch, then do something. Um, so community members, I mean, even the current dirt track, after we have a meet, 
people show up and start walking around it, which I find shocking because it's, it's not a great facility at this point. So we're gonna find so many people that are in the school district, our community members engage with this safe facility. So I think that it will be many people benefiting, not a few. Um, big picture, I think that the track becomes a catalyst for the behavior that we wanna see in our schools and in our community. It supports anti-bullying behavior. It supports inclusive behavior. It supports really just welcoming anyone based, you know, regardless of their gender, neurodiversity, ability level. Track is just a big, warm, inclusive hug of a sport. And that's rare. And I'll, I'll say again what I, I shared a quote from somebody the other day. Where else will you see an eighth grader cheering on a fifth grader? And that carries on in high school. And it's not just folks who can run, it's people who wanna jump, people who wanna throw, people who just wanna be with their friends in a safe location after school, doing things that we as parents and community members would be happy them doing instead of other things that they could be doing. So it's not just an infrastructure investment. It's a community investment, it's a social infrastructure investment that's going to lead to positive things that we want that have benefits that are beyond just what they're gonna get from an educational standpoint, but teaching them to be better people, better citizens. And it's rare when you could make an infrastructure change and have that kind of positive change. And I think this is one of those situations. And I strongly urge all board members to please vote to take the $400,000 of currently available unallocated funds and set them aside to make the track project happen. We're most of the way there. Let's get all the way there. Let's make it happen. Thank you. Boys, boys won. Yay! Uh, uh, second, can I get a sense of how many people we have both in the room and on the um, on Zoom who want to speak? I, one, two, three, and how many people? Uh, could you do one? Is there anyone who can? Is there anyone else who wants to speak besides? Sorry, my eyes are not as good as they used to be, Giovanna. Um, Huh? Not right here as they speak. Like, people are coming to speak. Okay, more people are coming. Uh, here they come. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you could try to limit your comments to one minute, just so we can be respectful of time and um, be concise, that would be appreciated. Um, so, continue with the room. Um, Good evening, school board. Uh, my name is Nathan Souter. I am a parent. I am a resident of town. Uh, both of my students participated in track and field in middle school, and I'm also the head coach of the middle school track and field team. This past spring, we had 79 student athletes participating on the track team. That's 20% of the entire enrollment at the middle school, which I'm super proud about. I contact the principal of the middle school and other uh, you know, school social worker and guidance counselor uh, every year before the season starts asking them to send students to the track team because it's a great inclusive environment. And I think that we get some students that way. We certainly get new faces every year. That's one of the things I love about the sport. Jim mentioned the positive culture. Eighth graders cheering on fifth graders. Uh, and then to Lisa's comment about sort of community and, and learning loss, my understanding is that one of the greatest deficits and one of the things we most need in the community and in the, in the student body is connection and community and rebuilding those ties that some, we, we weakened during COVID by being remote and being away from each other. Uh, track and field is multi-gender. It is multi-age. Uh, as Jacob said eloquently, you can choose different activities, so you can throw something heavy, you can run fast, you can jump high. Uh, again, super inclusive. A uh, couple years ago, we, uh, because we borrow equipment for our track meets, you know, we borrow 60 hurdles from uh, Spalding High School, which we bring on a trailer. We borrow high jump mats and high jump standards from Northfield, which we bring on a trailer. We were at a meet and one of the other coaches ca came up and said, I can't let my athletes do the high jump because you don't have a cover over the pits. 
And if they fall through the crack between the two high jump pits, they could be injured and I can't let them do that. I hadn't thought this through. Uh, we, I called a parent, they ran to Ace Hardware, or to Aubuchon Hardware, bought a gigantic blue tarp, brought it to the track meet, we covered the pits, made it safer, and continued with the track meet. Um, I was fine to respond to that. We're good with duct tape and chewing gum, but it would be wonderful to move beyond duct tape and chewing gum, chewing gum and into a modern facility that we can all be proud of for the next 20 years. Uh, in terms of the idea of opportunity cost, which of course any money spent by the school district is an opportunity cost, my understanding is that the administration has been extraordinarily proactive about finding where to use funds, whether they be ESSER funds or regular taxpayer dollars, to meet the needs of students with learning differences or students that I call the sort of the middle who, who don't qualify for an IEP or a 504 but still need extra services. My understanding is that we are advancing in those initiatives as well, which I, I would agree those, that's the highest priority. Um, this to me is different. It's not an annual ongoing operating cost. This is a one-time capital improvement, just like getting air conditioners or just like repairing a roof. And I would um, humbly submit that it's probably past time for the track to be updated given the condition that it's in. Uh, I, I also understand the, the wish to continue to do public engagement and get input on this project. I hope that we can, as a school board and as a district, get to yes on this project and then move on. I know that you have a, a annual budget to consider and other significant projects to consider, so I think there's some value to just moving on. Yeah, yeah, okay, more than a minute. Thank you for your time, thank you for your work. had a timer and I could just set like 90 seconds on my phone and when it goes off you're done. you're done okay okay good I'll do that uh, next please oh. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Ezra I'm one of the uh, team captains for cross country and track and field I've been doing it um, since middle school since sixth grade uh, and I've really enjoyed Nathan's track program um, in seventh grade we, got, we went to the U32's track, um, and that was kind of like the first, I think, like big school-wide sports, because uh, I think girls at the time didn't really have a lot of sports. You know, there was baseball, and not a whole lot of inclusion there, but track was really like bringing people together, which is cool. Um, and again, using U32's track is great, but why can't we have one here? Um, we're Montpelier, we're the capital. It kind of seems like we should have this facility. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to update that. Thanks. Sorry. Hey, I'll be quick. Uh, Tim Duggan, I'm a parent. Uh, my son's on the middle school track team, cross country, and is very fortunate to work with Nathan and the other folks in that program. Uh, I just sort of learned about that this was a project that was advancing quickly, and <clears throat> I share some of the concerns that um, my friend Lisa mentioned earlier, but what I, I guess I'm most concerned about is not seeing a process um, that sort of really kind of took a hard look at different options. I, um, I think the, the board and the administration generally does a really good job of being proactive and thoughtful, but if there is a $2 million um, pot of money that's unrestricted that could be used for transformational purpose, I think it would behoove everyone to just take a quick look at um, you know, a couple of core areas like learning loss, like special education needs, um, and other sort of areas that don't have as ready and uh, sort of uh, interest group to advance it. But there's a lot of um, core infrastructure needs, I think, that could be advanced. And so I just urge the board to take a really a brief minute to consider those things um, and have a thumbnail sketch maybe of what does two million buy me in these different areas and present it and then have a vote. Uh, I, really, I spent way too much time trying to figure this out over the past couple weeks once I learned it was moving so quick. And um, so I think it would be a good process. I think you could all be proud of the result. Um, but mostly I just want to thank you for your time, thank you for your work, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Tim. Avery? Hi. Um, my name is Avery. I'm the team captain for the Montpelier Boys cross-country team and track team. 
Um, I only started running as a freshman with the team, but I think it's changed me a ton as an individual. I think it's changed the path of my life. I'm actually going to be running in college, and that really helped with like admission. Um, so that kind of is a long-term effect of running. I found a group of boys who are super, super awesome, and uh, they hold me to be a better person every day, and I think we hold each other. They, um, a lot of Montpelier boys and even U32 boys, uh, and it's part of the beauty of running. Uh, one, because we don't have as good of a track, we actually, the Montpelier boys went up to U32 and did a workout with them yesterday um, on their track because they have one. And uh, I think that we're the state capital. We could host the state meet. We could bring more people here. And I think that it'd be a really great opportunity to improve the school. And again, it's a one-time kind of infrastructure. Um, and it, it seems like a really great opportunity to improve just athletics and increase turnout of kids. Just so we, so uh, the person taking minutes can get it. I know who you are, but she oh, might. Oh, yeah, Avery Smart. Yeah, there you go. Thanks. Thank you, Avery. Hey, guys. My name is Noah Rivera. And unlike Avery and Ezra back there, this is my first year at Montpelier High School. I actually transferred here from Harwood last year. And this is a wonderful school, but one of the big things that made me transfer was the friendships I built with these guys. And I built that over the track season. Every meet I would go to, I would see the Montpelier team. And they had such a great energy, and they always made me smile and included me like I was one of them. And it was great. Um, and you just really don't see that anywhere but track. I mean, look at this. We have the entire U32 team who's supposed to be our rivals. They're here to support the track from Montpelier. And I think that just speaks volumes about the community, of the track team, and the importance to all of us on the track team. So I just, it would be really meaningful to have the appreciation and to be able to have the track. And I think that could bring a lot of new people into this wonderful community. And I think that would be a great thing. Thank you. Uh, others? Great, thank you everyone. And um, on Zoom, uh, I know Giovanna wanted to speak. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, we can't hear you. We can't hear her, but she's not muted. It doesn't look like you're muted, but it might be something audio on your end. Could be our speakers. Or it could be our, our end, too. Oh, do we have the sound on? Apologies. Give us, give us a second. Give us a minute, Giovanna. Sorry about this. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Giovanna, you're not using headphones, are you? Do you have headphones in? Okay. I think that's for us. We could test and have the next person unmute just to see if their volume is working to make sure that it's on her. Heather's, Heather's on and she says it's definitely our end because okay. she Heather can hear her just fine. Uh -huh. Thank okay. you, Heather. Thanks for the. Have she tried to speak again? Giovanna, can you try again? Um, yep. No. Can we get it through a computer? Mm. It'd have to be his computer, mm. I think. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah. I'm already I on it. I think it's a I good can't. suggestion. It's what? through there. To what? Their computer. Yeah. No. We've got all these yeah, teenagers in the room. I feel yeah. like <laughs> <laughs> one of them should be able to figure it out. I can hear you now, yes. Anakit. Thank you, Anakit. Thanks for sticking with us through the technical Yes, difficulties. apologies for that. Um, do we have anyone else on Zoom who wants to speak? Is there anyone with a hand up? Mm -hmm. No? All right, well, um, thank you, everyone. We appreciate the public comment, uh, as always. Um, next order of business is consent agenda. I just Mia, have a quick Obama. question about the agenda if yes that's okay um i also just want i feel like sometimes when we have a lot of public at a meeting just nice to like really honor the fact that you all came to yes. speak to us so i don't know what your schedules are like tonight and if you have to leave but i just want to give a heartfelt thank you to everybody who came to speak because our work as a board is greatly improved by community input so um it's been really helpful for me to hear from the community on, on both sides on this topic. Yeah, um, absolutely. And I'm wondering if, you know, we might be able to move the discussion on the agenda up a little bit. I know we have um, a presentation and committee report, but it does seem like there's people that might want to stay for this and it feels um, uncomfortable for me to make them wait that long for that part of the discussion. Can I just disagree with that? Because I think it would be really helpful for me to look at this data presentation as back data that, to inform the way that I'm thinking about the track decision. Mm -hmm. So, I, because I think it's the big picture, one of the pieces of the big picture that I'm asking. So, to move that conversation, it feels to me like it's going to miss a piece of info that I need. Do other, others have thoughts? I agree with Alan, but I'm not really. I think that people need that presentation to make their decision, then. Oh, yeah. yeah, we should keep it the way it is. More of feels that way, and no one else has other strong feelings. Let's go with the agenda as proposed. Um, and again, um, thank you, everyone. I definitely appreciate it. And if you can stick with us, please do. And if not, we totally understand. Also, you know, we are on Zoom if you, uh, um, yeah. Do we have more seats? Yeah, if they go here, they can figure it out. Huh? <laughs> there's, there's there's yeah. Yeah. Right here. yeah, if anybody wants to have a seat. Yeah, and also, I think we're, well, we're not done with those chairs. Um, there, there are a few chairs here, and there's a few benches, so if you guys want to um, 
And you're teenagers, so you can sit on the floor too. It doesn't doesn't break you like it does those older folks. Uh, and and it is on the agenda for seven thirty. Yes. So that's a half an hour from now. Maybe. That's that's looking Maybe. a little aspirational. Yeah. And I do want to just also another a quick. We have several policy readings. If we are feeling that we are running on fumes at that point, I think some or all of those could be pushed to a different meeting. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Um, so consent agenda, do I have a motion to approve a consent agenda? I'll move that we approve the consent agenda. Um, do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? I just yes. wanted to, um, this wasn't exactly in your superintendent report, Libby, but I thought I'd take advantage of the fact that we have a bigger audience than we normally do and put in a plug for our district blog and podcast, um, especially the most recent episode with Jess Murray and Adriana and Kale, two of our students. Um, the topic is restorative practices in our schools. And I will say Adriana and Kale were honest <laughs> in a way that only kids can be. And it was an incredibly informative um, listen for me. So I just wanted to encourage everybody who's listening to subscribe to the In the Schools podcast and definitely listen to the most recent episode, number 13, I think it is. Excellent, thank you. No, and um, that's a great plug because there's a lot of really good information. And blog, new blog. And the blog. The You're next right. post is coming out soon, yeah. and I am out in Roxbury, and Danny Belez is fourth, yes. through fourth class. Yeah. Of course. Yeah, so you, there's definitely a lot to be learned on those. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Right, great, thank you. So we are only 15 minutes behind schedule now. Um, Paul, academic data. Amanda, I'm going to ask, I know you're on the Zoom. Can you, sh I just shared the presentation with you every time. The only time I share my screen is during a school board meeting and I forget that I have to fix the Zoom. Something's wrong with my computer and oh. Zoom and sharing the screen, but I just shared it with you. Can you pull it up? I'm sorry. I think she might need to be a host. Oh, I need to. Um, or does she not need to be a host to share? Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, hold on. Okay, I just changed it. All participants can change. I also shared it with Heather. Heather, if you could share your screen, too. Or Heather, one of the two. Thank you. I'm sorry, yeah, Amanda. <laughs> um, Go over to um, Slideshow. Upper right. Oh, Upper right. Button. All right. Yep, I will. Okay, so uh, this is uh, from our fall data snapshot. Mike Berry apologizes for not being here today. It is his anniversary. Um, and so he was told he had to do that instead, yeah, <laughs> which fair. is understandable. So yeah. I am going to step in for Mike today. Um, so getting into our academic data, we also have Peggy, Sue, and Jess here who are going to talk about SEL and special education data. Um, academics is up first. He's got some nice color coding. Mike created these slides for us tonight. Just a reminder to the board that when we're talking about academic data, we're talking about four areas of data. There's state and national data. The state data uh, was up until this school year, SBAC. Um, and the new science or the, the science exam, the state has decided to um, go away from us back. So we have something new. I cannot answer any questions about it because I have not been getting any information about it except that it's called Cognia and we will be doing it in the spring. So that is all I know about it. Um, the national data is, of course, the NAEP. Uh, that will still be in place. The benchmark screening data is another form that we do. We actually do this. Uh, K through 12 um, for our screening data. And, and it's important to keep in mind what screeners do. Screeners are not necessarily what we want our teachers using for, to pinpoint instructional moves because that's not the purpose of them. It's too broad. Our screener is done on a computer. Um, so it is a computer test. So just thinking about that, passages are short. Um, they're, they're more basic in the level of rigor that's being asked. It is tied to the Common Core. Um, but they're a different type of, or, uh, 
assessment than our diagnostics, which are next. So diagnostic data does give us information about what we can do with our readers and mathematicians um, immediately, like the next day. Um, so, and oftentimes when the screening data comes in and it shows a kid is scoring lower on the screener, um, then we'd often go into more robust diagnostics um, to get more of a sense of what exactly the, kid, the kiddo needs for um, skills and strategy work. And then we have our local data that's teacher created. They're created usually in professional learning committees <coughs> and communities, sorry, with teacher teams around unit assessments, formative assessments. Um, that, is, that is a subjective create, created or teacher created measure. Um, so just thinking about these forms of data is important when we're talking about data. So you can go ahead, Amanda. Sorry, interrupting your note taking up there. <clears throat> Should I? Yeah, click it, click it all the way through. So um, when we're thinking about data, we collect it um, from these multiple measures. I know that's really small. Mike has a has a thing for very small text on a screen. I'm poly I apologize for that. Then we analyze it both at the district level, we analyze it at the administrative level, we analyze it at the teacher level, we respond to what it's saying, and then we monitor the, what's happening. Um, and this presentation will, of course, be part of the board packet, so, um, so I won't read you all those, all those pieces in there, and the board has a copy of it. Um, but it explains in each of those areas what that looks like in each school. So you can keep going, Amanda. So for our um, state and national data, he's continuing with this color coding here. SBAC, um, in terms of, we are going to show you some SBAC school-wide data, but it's technically still embargoed. Families will be receiving, if they haven't already, their individual child's report that we can send out, but technically the scores are embargoed for any kind of disaggregating the data or anything like that. But we do have, because they're available on the individual child report, how the school did. Like we thought, if that's on the individual child report, report, then that must not be embargoed information anymore. So we will be showing you that tonight. The benchmark screening data is from our Renaissance Star results. You can see from the district-wide level, um, the results from the fall scores there. The, the um, green is at or above benchmark. The blue there is um, on watch. That's, that is Re Renaissance Star language, not MRPS language necessarily the yellow um, they would be saying is in need of intervention and the, and the urgent inter intervention is the red. Um, we have a different definition perhaps of what that means than Renaissance Star, um, but it's important to note that that's their language. And then our diagnostic data, you can just see a sample of what's in our data dashboard here for students. It's what it looks like at, a, at the um, teacher level and at the administration level. So we'll look at these scores and see where kids are. Um, in our data days and teachers and PLCs are looking at all the time and then our local data um, So we have you know, for instance, this is just a sample from math skills um, It informs both at the individual student level and the whole class level and in this particular example it was from eighth grade we We're able to easily see that the skills of multiplying mixed numbers dividing decimals prime factorizations multiply and divide by integers were all areas of need for the classes informing our first instruct, er, instructional strategies. Um, so that's just a snapshot of what we're looking at. I just have a clarifying question. In the yellow rectangle, yep. is that one student or is that a oh, class? Oh, no, 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 that's a class. That's a class. Or that's a and snippet of a class. Also in the blue is a class? Yeah. Or one student? Yeah, okay. yeah, no, that's not one student. So each of the rows would be a different student. Oh, okay. And, and the that's, blue. that's just a snippet. It's just a screenshot of it. It's not a whole entire class, but yeah, right. okay. it's a snippet. We just wanted to show you like what it looks like from our end uh -huh. um, when we're looking at the data. Yeah, that's helpful. So if we move on, um, this is some of our SBAC information at the elementary school. So we have both UES and RVS. Our SBAC, they take it at, start taking the SBAC at grade three. Um, this is for last year's score reports. It's hard to look now at trends from SBAC because of the pandemic. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't taken one year. Last year was very optional and we had many students who opted out of it last, or two years ago, sorry. And uh, this past year, students did take it. These are how our scores were slightly above the state average um, for both of our schools with the exception of fourth grade math and at RVS, which is slightly below it. 
Can you just say a little bit more about what that number means? It's a scaled score. So, um, of course, you'd, you'd ask me that. It's, it's a range. So when we're looking at, and you'll see when you get your kiddos' individual score, okay. when you get mile score. So um, the range of a one is this, this range of scaled scores. And then there's a scaled scores of two. And then there's a range of three. Like, okay. And so students score within those ranges. And you'll be able to see, like, are they a high three? Or are they just barely make it into that three proficiency? Um, so it's, it's basically how they scored in a very highfalutin mental like scoring mentality which is really hard to pinpoint yeah. and explain away because it the scale score doesn't stay the same each year it depends on the kids taking the tests and what it it's a it's a very um, detailed uh, number for how the state gets that the state assigns that we don't and the most important thing here is where are we com at, uh, compared to the rest of the state is that the way to think about this how are we doing the state, so it's the state average. So you, if you'd like to compare it to the state average, you can. Um, this is this is saying that we are proficient essentially in these. If you looked at the scaled scores, this is what's embargoed still. Okay. You would see that, you know, Union Elementary School for Grade Three ELA is proficient, it has this many kids proficient. That's what we can't show you the gotcha. percentage, the actual percentage. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, it's uh, it's sort of. it's the state more than us right now at this it. part. I think Emma has a question. Um, do we have access to the national scale score? Like, could we compare ourselves against the national average? Not everybody takes the SVAC. Not every state. Right. Yeah. So there's a consortium, um, yeah. and I can't remember how many states actually use the SVAC. Mm -hmm. um, so I imagine we would be able to find that number somewhere. Mm -hmm. I, it's got to be out there, right? <laughs> I would imagine. I have that number in here as just a point of reference. It is not something that the state gives us. We'd have to go search for it. Go and research yeah. it. Yep. Yeah. But, uh, and I think it, it, uh, I'll ask mm -hmm. the questions at the end. You OK? Yeah, I guess my question is around like, can we compare ourselves? Like, how are girls versus boys doing? We, how that's like, what's embargoed okay. right now. Yes. OK. We can do it internally, but they haven't told us we can do it publicly yet. OK. Um, Amanda, if you want to keep going. So this is our, sorry, I just slipped my own slide. This is our MSMS information. Um, less bars, of course, because we have only one school there. So it's just MSMS compared to the rest of the state. We are above the state average in each area. Again, I'd love to be able to show you the, what the actual proficiency level is and the amount of the percent of kids who are proficient. That's what's embargoed. So it's, it's generalized knowledge, I guess. <laughs> um, and then here's MHS. They take it in ninth grade, um, ELA and math. So pretty much across the board, we scored very similarly, sl just slightly above the state average in ELA and math. This is the Renaissance Star reading. Oh, thanks, Amanda, for, for keep going. <clears throat> so when you're looking at this, um, you can see the first bar there. Well, maybe you can't because it's so small. The first bar is Main Street Middle School. So according to our, our screener data, so keeping in mind this is the screener data, not diagnostic data. So this isn't data that the teacher is going to use the next day. But this is an overall looking at programmatic um, and and giving us some idea of who we really need to target immediately. Um, so Main Street Middle School in reading scored seven in the fall, which was early October for when they took it, scored 72% at or above proficiency. At Montpelier High School, <clears throat> that number is 60, something on my screen, <laughs> sorry, 62 point, 62%. At Roxbury Village School, 40%. And at Union Elementary School is 68%. We're at or above benchmark on the, on the screener data. It's just really important to, to keep in mind what assessment we're looking at and what that does for us, what it tells us. It's, this is really broad, generalized information is what a screener tells us. Um, the star math in the next slide. Uh, similar results there. Main Street Middle School was 64%. Montpelier High School was 64%. Roxbury Village School was 48%. And Union Elementary School was, was 71, almost 72% at above, at above benchmark on the screener in math. 
The Fontes and Pinnell um, is the diagnostic measure for um, our little guys. So you see right now first grade because our kindergartners don't actually take the Fontes and Pinnell in the fall. Um, it's with actual text. So the child is reading a text to their teacher and answering comprehension questions about it. That, and so it's more diagnostic. A teacher could use the information immediately with a, with a child. Um, so Fontes and Pinnell is the company that we use or the, the diagnostic that we use. And um, at Union Elementary School, 79% um, are proficient or higher in the diagnostic. So this gives us much more information about what kids are actually doing as readers. And at Roxbury Village School, 57% were proficient or higher on the Fontes and Pinnell. So, and remember, we're just talking in the fall, first graders through, through fourth graders, not kindergartners, or certainly pre-K. You can. Do you also use the curriculum for Fontes and Pinnell? No, we don't have. Just the that we is. use the. We have the. They have what's called the level, the LLI kits, um, level learning. Totally blanking on. on Thank you, level, level literacy intervention. Thank you, Peggy Sue. We do have those pieces. We use it as a resource for kids who are in need of, who are kind of tangled in reading. Um, we do not use it cover to cover, like following every direction in it, because we are of the belief that we need to know the kid's targeted skill that the child needs and then match the resource to that skill, rather than saying you're going to do this whole program regardless of what skills you need. So we have a little different mentality than what the program does. Um, but we do have that that um, resource for our teachers. I was just at a conference conversation around uh, some of the racism that are embedded into some of those curriculum. So just to note around our curriculum and racial justice mm -hmm. pieces of it. In tier three, so if you keep going, Amanda, so the board will remember that we, our true focus within our four pillars is the timely systems for remediate, um, intervene, and enrich. And so we've had our first cycle go through. So this year we've really changed it up on our interventionists um, and we've asked them to do very short, intentional, targeted cycles. This was the first time they've done it. Um, they've never done it this way. Uh, and we're basically like, let's see what happens, right? So we had our first cycle and we had a lot of successes and we're having a lot of uh, places where we've got learning that we were pulling in and, and feedback from kids, results for kids. So some of our successes is that we have our universal skills named K through 12. So when a child is in need of remediation, it means they're pretty tangled. That's a universal skill we're talking about. So it's, a, it's almost like a catch up skill for lack of a better term usually around two grade levels behind what um, it typically where it typically is taught so those universal skills are what we remediate in the first cycle or tier three um, at union we had 56 students who qualified for that rbs had 14 msms had 25 and mhs had 27 all those the first cycle was completed and we have data about what happened during that cycle um, we're using new data tools and we're act actively tracking targeted skills, um, the goals and the progress for each student. What's really cool is our kindergarten interventionist, Rachel, is like jumping like to the moon because she's, she used to be a kindergarten teacher, a very good one, and she's like, we've got all our kindergartners know their, knowing their upper and lowercase letters now. Like that's never happened. We, we could never make that statement in, in October. Um, and it's through her work in the tier three. So it's super excited that we can say those kind of things now. Um, we are tracking attendance information for students and as with the intervention, you know, and not surprisingly, kids who are showing up at a, a less time for in, when they're in need of tier three don't have the same success as kids who are there every day. Um, so UES, for instance, added almost a 90% attendance rate for kids who, who were in this first cycle of tier three instruction, and they had a lot of success in this um, tier. Um, but that's connected to our learnings. Well, the other thing we're learning is that each of our different school buildings have different systems and structures and, and personnel, right? And so because of the structure here at MHS, for instance, where a student who um, re went through this first cycle of remediation at UES got 15 sessions with an expert, at MHS, because of the schedule alone, they got five sessions. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a schedule thing, 
that, and then if a child was absent for one of those five sessions, right, like it, it multiplies much at a much greater rate. So that's one of our learnings, like how do we figure that out? Um, so we're really digging into that level of detail right now. Um, I know Jason was here or is here, there he is. <laughs> and we're yes. having lots of conversations about what could that look like um, so that kids who need this type of support were not hindered by a schedule. Like that shouldn't happen, right? So um, it was really interesting data for us to look at. We're continuing to work on making very targeted goals. So I, was ta I took a brief glance over um, what, this screen right here, which is great that Amanda just pulled it up. And, and some of the goals that were written are really targeted and intentional, and we want that because each little small win is gonna build that kid's confidence and that they can do the next one and the next one and the next one. Domino effect, right? And some of our goals just aren't targeted enough yet. So for instance, use illustrations to figure out the meaning of text. That's not targeted enough. Um, and it's not gonna move a reader forward who's tangled in reading. So we've learned that we still need some more work on, on forming those targeted goals. So the, this here are examples of goals that have been set with kids. Yep, and uh -huh. so this is an example, just a screenshot of a set of how we're collecting data. Um, and so you can see what the goal statement was. You can see how goal one compared different forms of an expression. Um, so it's a math goal from UES. And so that child, after you know the first kind of formative assessment was at level two proficient, at the next formative assessment for that same goal, they were proficient. So they no longer, they've mastered that goal, right? Um, and you can see you know, looking at this entire um, spreadsheet, you can see some pretty group, big growth with kids. Um, so it, it's cool that we have this. Amanda, because I know what your question's gonna be. Um, we, our systems, because they're new systems with VCAT and PowerSchool, they're not talking to each other yet. We're in process with um, the guy who makes VCAT. Um, and so if we, right now, we'd have to go in and hand key all demographic, gender, all that, we'd have to hand key it for every single student. And we just simply don't have the time to prioritize that right now. We can get the systems, we're working on getting the systems talking. So what I said to Mike was the next time we present this kind of information to the board, we'll be able to disaggregate it, right? And he said, sure, we will. <laughs> So that's why you don't have disaggregated information right now. And it's another learning. We have to get that up and going, right? Hold on one second, Amanda. Sorry. Um, so doing this type of work is still um, a learning process for our educators um, and for our system. So we're, we're still in this process of, of making sure that we're doing the right work with kids who are really tangled up. Um, and I think we've made a lot of inroads already uh, this year. Um, let me think other learnings that we've had. Oh, the other thing we've really learned is that students who come in who are new to our district, we have to figure out a different, an onboarding process for them where we get assessment information right away for students. Um, we had a significant increase in students at UES in particular um, who were coming in with a different level of knowledge than what our typical second grader has. Um, and so we have to figure that out when we get a new child, what's that look like for the child in terms of not only building relationships with our classmates and their teachers and all that kind of stuff, which is super important, and also getting a very specific picture of their learning needs right away. Um, so that's something that we've learned this year or we're paying attention to this year. Okay, so Amanda, if you could go to the longitudinal da screener data, the liter that one, yeah. So this is a kind of cool screen. Um, I took a snapshot. The link there with literacy is all of the grades. This is um, essentially the same cohort of kids for the screener data. Okay, so we're in the larger, broader, generalized screener data. So this is grade four right here, all of our grade fours. It's grade four at UES and RBS. It's not split up by school. Um, so in 2019, 20, when this group first took the screener, they, they were at a 66% um, proficiency level as first graders. You can follow this same cohort of kids up to grade four in literacy, and at grade four, the, they just took this assessment this fall, they're at 71% in the screener data. Um, now, keep in mind, like in 2019, 2020, what year we were in there, that was the year of potting. Yes, potting. No, that's when the pandemic hit. Yeah. March 
2020. March 2020. Oh, yes, that was the year we... So so we was 21 or 2021. So we had a really low, like they we had, they had 56 kids in that cohort, and then and now we have 82 kids in that cohort, right? So there's a significant change in the number of students who took this assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not technically the exact same kids, um, but it is the cohort of kids following them across. So when the national media is talking about learning loss, this is one way we can track. Do we have that similar trend here, right? And, and so in eighth grade, you can see similar results and a similar number of kids. We went from 75 kids who took it in 1920 to 81 kids who just took it this past fall. Um, and we were at 72% were proficient in 2019-20, and we moved to, uh, we're at 69%, which is statistically um, valid within 5%, right? And so, um, so our children, according to our screener data, broad, generalized, programmatic measures are not showing significant learning loss um, here in our literacy data. And again, I put, this is the same from, for all of our grades. We'll get the same results. There's one little snippet in one of the grades, and I can't remember which one it is, but that link, the literacy where it's linked there, you can see the cohorts in every grade. I just gave a, a screenshot here. Keep going, Amanda. Similar screen in math. So again, I showed the fourth and eighth grade. It's interesting, 66 kids took it in math in 1920. I'm not sure why less kids took it in reading. But um, you'll see a similar result here in math. 88% uh, of those 66 kids were proficient in 2019-20. 74% were proficient in 22-23. Um, a slight decrease, not a huge one, and a significantly more students took the assessment um, this past fall. And then uh, for eighth grade, <clears throat> it was similar results. We had 67% were proficient in 1920 and 67% were proficient in 22-23. Uh, so when we're thinking about longitude and data through the pandemic, this, these are the types of things we can look at because SBAC was interrupted, diagnostics were interrupted, but the screeners stayed put. So this is, a t this is one common measurement we can look at um, in our particular data, um, which is kind of cool, right? Any questions about the academics before we put Jess on the stage? I had oh, these two data. can attest that I had that conversation. I said, we're going to be able to do that next time, right? Yep, yeah, sure. <clears throat> do you want us to hold our questions? Uh, well, I mean, so this is a lot of data. I yeah. mean, I remember last year we were looking at SBAC scores and, and, and we were all kind of like, or at least even you, we were just like, we, we're getting it, we're getting it, and here it is. So. We're getting closer. It's not getting there. Not quite here yet, but it, we're getting well, closer. Well, right, right, we're not there, because this is, this is a learning process. Mm -hmm. um, I imagine teachers are in the learning curve process and there's a lot of excitement how do, do you think that there are, um, there's a difference between being excited about the data and really knowing what to do with it, I guess. Mm -hmm. And so that is a second process. Mm -hmm. So how, where, where, how do you see that, pro like last year sort of getting data, this year continuing to get data, learning to read it, but the conversation about what to do with it essentially, because you're talking about this child needs these three things out of 50 maybe things that they should be at and sort of how how is how is the process of getting the team on board with sort of figuring out how to zero in and and you're saying that there's not time in the high school no there is time but you just it's have harder, to figure out how to, use to find the time. time in the yeah. high school because of schedules which makes sense because older kids have more things going on it still really means, I mean, I know at, at, at RVS, there's wind block. Mm -hmm. And that is a new thing that allows kids to be sort of grouped in a lot of different ways. And there are certain kids that are getting really, really great opportunities there. And some kids that don't need that high level of, of sort of really specific instruction are actually going and helping younger kids and they're reading to kids and they're doing all, other kind of wonderful things too. Um, so I guess. Sorry, what is 
it's what what, what I, need. I need. So it's a it's basically an intervention block that everyone it was a non negotiable. Every one of our schools have something like that. RVS calls it win. Uh, MSMS calls it the SST. I'm not sure. I think UAS might call it win too. We call it soul and block here at at the high school. It's owl time. What is it? Owl time. Owl time. So how's the learning curve with the using the data, I guess? How does that seem and, and sort of? It's on a couple of levels and it's really fascinating, okay. right? So, um, so I was talking to Katie about this just yesterday. Um, and I said, well, what, if you were gonna write this slide, that tier three slide for the board, what would you put in it in terms of successes and learnings, right? And um, one of the things that she said to me was, we have more to do work to do on another pillar that I didn't expect. So another pillar we have is collective responsibility and cl collective or collaborative responsibility and collective efficacy. And one of the things that we're learning is our UES interventions in particular are very good at targeting intentional skills. They they actually could lead this work for the rest of the district. They're they're very good at that, for the most part. And um, one of the things that's happening is that because we've switched how we're providing remedial services and being more intentional about it. No longer is a teacher able to say, hey, can you just come read with Johnny for a little bit? Which we had no evidence was working and that was what was happening in the past. And so um, there's a little bit of a rub right now going on between general te generalized teachers in the classroom and interventionists in terms of we're collectively working to move ch children forward, which was interesting. She didn't expect that. Um, and it's happening in more grades than the other. Another thing we're learning is that how do we use that data? How do we, how do we make those groups? How do we decide who's teaching what um, during wind blocks or owl time? Um, and uh, so at the guiding coalition level, which is the te teacher leadership team at UES, um, which has representation from each of the grade levels, K1, K1 and 2 were very successfully looking at common formative assessment diagnostic data as a grade level and saying, I'll teach this group, I'll teach this group, I'll teach this group, I'll target these, these kids. Three and four weren't doing that yet. And so in the Guiding Coalition, they talked about how, how K through two were doing that process. And three and four, because there's a little peer pressure and competitiveness, not your wife at all, Nathan, um, <laughs> not at all. And we're like, wait, hold on. That's what's working right now. I'll go, we'll go do that. We'll go talk to our team about that. So there's some dip. Like it's an organic process a little bit, and it's it's like it's also a controlled kind of we're gonna we're gonna move them to the next level as they're working on it. Now there is a lot of learning, particularly at RVS and MS MHS, I would say, around we have this information. How, what's the teaching move we make in order that's gonna bring the biggest bang for our buck? And one of the things that teachers are doing right now is they're making a playbook, not only a formative assessment, because there's a lot of common universal skills, right? So we're making a playbook of instructional, instructional strategies that really worked and we have evidence that it really worked in a short amount of time. And we're also making a playbook of common formative assessments. And so then teachers who are maybe not as skilled or are building their capacity still in that kind of intentional teaching will have a resource that other colleagues have created and we have evidence that it's successful. So we're building that kind of skill. There is a lot of development though, um, particularly at RVS and MHS, because it's a brand new thing for MHS. We've never actually had real interventionists here um, who were targeted in this way. It just hasn't, we did, haven't had that human resource here before. So we now have that here. Now we have to figure out how to best use it for our adolescents, which is tricky. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I knew There's it was a challenge. Learning. Just talking more to it is all I wanted yeah. you to do. Really, There's more learning to be done it's there. It's a process. It's a process. And, yeah, it's a definite it's process. Definitely. Oh, yeah, so I mean, this is really interesting that our, in our district we haven't seen significant learning loss. We don't have evidence of significant right. learning loss. We have evidence of loss in other areas, but not in, learn, so not in do academic you, data. Do you have a sense then how MRPS compares to other districts or schools around the state or around the nation in terms I don't, of learning loss? I only have media reports, okay. right? I'm not, and that term popped up pretty quickly within COVID. Right? <laughs> um, without a whole lot of evidence to back it up. Alver, I can't, like I know that my niece wasn't in, wasn't in school for a very long time, right? And um, so she got a different schooling experience than our children who were in school potted with two, in K-8, two 
professional teachers. <coughs> That's a very different learning experience than my niece in Washington, D.C., who was out of school for two years um, and doing virtual learning. So there, it's, it's tricky to, I don't know, I can make that statement. Okay. I'm not sure. Do you feel that we have the evidence to back that we don't have an early loss or, or that we are learning uh, whether or not we are going to? We have does not suggest significant learning loss for the majority of our students. That's not to say that there isn't some for some students. You know, I would never make that statement. But the evidence that we have, and this is a good snapshot, and you can click on those links and see, that's, that's kind of, I always say that we use screeners incorrectly. This is actually a correct way to use a screener, right? To look at across time longitudinal data. Um, and um, I will say, however, that Peggy Sue will speak to in just a minute, we have a large uptick in parents requesting special education evaluations right now, this year, this school year. And so there, that might show some evidence of something else, right? Our academic data doesn't show that, that we have here. I will say that our social emotional learning data shows that there's a loss or there's a need for um, significant supports in community building, relationship building, how we treat each other, that kind of thing. I lost it. It just went. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Others or to, to I don't want to reason. derail us. Um, oh. And I think this is fantastic. I love the longitudinal. That's exactly what we've sort of always tried to figure out and don't actually look at, so that's really helpful. I just didn't know if you had any comment about on the earlier slides, and maybe your point was really we, those are limited in what they can tell us, but the Renaissance star math and star reading, the much lower scores for Roxbury, like what does that tell us? Like it looks pretty dramatic. We have our eyes pretty close on the instruction that's happening at Roxbury. I think that we have a lot of capacity building to do in instructional strategies at Roxbury Village School, particularly in the area of reading. Do the reading. numbers also affect No. Mm -hmm. It would with the F and P. That, that would have a, because you know, two, child, two children would skew it more um, in a diagnostic. Kristen? Yeah, I had a question about the Renaissance. Um, you had mentioned that kind of the color code that, you know, this is kind of what Renaissance or STAR produces, but that sort of like goes through an MRPS filter, and then it looks differently in terms of how it shows up in, in intervention and services. What, what, how does, so how does it go through the MRPS filter, and yeah. what does it become? Good question. So we really feel focused on that red first mm -hmm. um, for immediate diagnostic, like what's happening? What does Renaissance STAR say the skills are that they're missing? And then let's do some more diagnostics to really understand it and triangulate the data, right? Oftentimes with the yellow, oftentimes those are grade level, like they're what the kid, child is going to be working on anyway, mm -hmm. um, in, a, in perhaps a different way in their grade level. So. Um, yes, we look at what those skills are, but we look at it with the lens of what, what's the student going to be doing anyway mm -hmm. during that time, mm -hmm. during their grade level, and what's far, if they're in the red, then, then they have the potential from this screening data to, be, to need universal skill work, which we have defined, defined as remediation in Tier 3 done by a professional, um, usually in a one-to-one -one setting with very targeted skill work. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's a lot of educational jargon. I'm yeah. sorry. I hear that every now and again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm curious too if, like, you know, we have interventionists that are budgeted through ESSER. Is and any local of this funds. And what's up? Fund. Not just ESSER. Okay. Most so of local them are in local funds. Mo okay. So in terms of, is this data that you're seeing? redistributing, reallocating? Is there anything? Because right, the the interventionists can be fluid between buildings. Is that true? And so I'm just wondering if this is kind of they if there's any. They're not. Uh huh. So is any of this data, any rethinking happening in terms of how the district distributes interventionists across the schools? No, mm -hmm. we are not looking at that right now. Mm -hmm. Not right now. That because there's a lot of feelings and culture involved in that as well. <laughs> so when we hire them, as the, of course, teachers are district employees, right? Mm -hmm. They work for Montpelier Roxbury Public Schools, and if we're 
if we reassign them based on their licensure, we can't, we have that right to do that, mm -hmm. it, it can be a climate killer. Mm -hmm. So um, we do that sparingly mm -hmm. in emergency situations. Mm -hmm. um, and when I think about Roxbury in particular, there, so thinking about the number of children who took this assessment and the number of adults available to service them is a very good ratio. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So the adults in the room supporting while, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is a very good right. ratio already at yeah. Roxbury Village School. There is a worry I have that I'm sure Peggy Slew can speak to as well. The more adults that are in a classroom, the more enabled the kid, kids become mm -hmm. of the adults. So imagine three or four adults in a classroom, a, a teacher sends kids off to do independent work, three or four adults immediately come over and instead of that child thinking for themselves and starting up the work by themselves, they'll wait until an adult sits with them and re you know what I mean, does the work. And we are very helpful creatures mm -hmm. and we do the work for them, mm -hmm. right? So there's, we don't wanna create that kind of environment either. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Amanda? Sorry, I remember. Do, we, do you think we have enough interventionists to support the reds and the yellows? The board may right see now. some interventionists coming in the budget um, in SEL. And at Main Street Middle School, we have two math interventionists and one ELA interventionist currently. Um, well, we have two math interventionists budgeted. We have one hired, one open position. Um, and I would argue just by ratio, a school of 400 students needs more there, especially when we know how tricky it is at the high school level to, to fill those universal skill needs. We wanna get them before they go there. So the, the board may see that in the budget process as part of what we're prioritizing. But we also have spent, as Jim can attest, being here the longest, considerable resources since I've started as superintendent to build the human capacity in this field. Absolutely. Um, so we, you know, when I first started, I think we had two across the district. Um, and now our team is much larger. So we have, we have spent a considerable resource moving in this direction. I didn't want to put tons in at one point, as Jim can talk to, because I didn't want to put people in without the system in place. And now we're getting the system in place and we have the human resources yeah. to move forward. Yeah, yeah, no, these are systems that are built over time. And yeah. there's been huge advancement, but more is needed. Um, you ready for? Jess is yeah. up first. Yay. Thanks for having me back, everyone. Um, so, yes. Um, so, just as Libby was talking about academics, we really work to collect data, analyze it, and then use that to respond and monitor in the SEL world as well. So we've had some really exciting process as far as SEL data. We're certainly still building the systems, but a lot of the SEL data that you're going to see tonight has been brand new for this year. Um, so some of the systems we have are the behavioral dashboard, um, and that is three out of the four schools. So RBS, MHS, and MSMS all use the behavior dashboard, and that is really tracking incidents for school per kid. Um, and UES is using SWIFTS um, simply because they were used to it and it was really embedded in their culture, but they do very similar things as far as being able to track data. Um, and then our attendance dashboard is thanks to Nick Connor. Um, he has really developed that from the ground up so that we can look at chronic absenteeism. Um, and we, of course, have a lot of individual student data for students who have really intensive SEL needs. We have individual ways that we track data to really ensure that we're catching all the data for those students. Um, so these systems have allowed us to really think about how teachers are responding to data, both at the individual level and at the class level, at the district level. So we have a lot of different levels within so we can see how teachers are responding and the impact of their response. Um, which can then inform future responses. It also talks about location um, in the day. We talk about a lot of school and district themes within the data, and we can break down um, student demographics. So, you know, I'll talk a little bit about who's over overrepresented in our data, um, both in the attendance and the behavioral. Thank you. 
So again, these are have really big growth in the first two months of school. Um, we are using this data on a very regular basis um, for grade level teams, for guiding coalitions, which are really our teacher teams that are moving this work forward, and our resiliency teams, which are essentially our SEL education support teams who are looking at this data and really thinking about how to match student needs with um, SEL services. So some examples of the work that we've done here is we've started asking questions about themes. So when Jason was presenting to us um, a few weeks ago for Data Day, we happened to notice and he pointed out that like Tuesdays seem to be a really big day for whatever reason around student behavior. And just that's an example of something that we wouldn't have been able to catch before and was really surprising and unexpected for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not like near the weekend, it's not transition day. Yeah, so, um, and then the UES PBAS team has been really wonderfully using this data. They reflect on this every other week. Um, and they recently just put together a like a full school assembly because they were looking at the data and seeing that playground behaviors were the highest and that was some learning that needed to happen. So they put together this really, adorable assembly about how to keep your body safe and make good decisions on the playground. Um, and they're tracking the impact of that over time and have seen a decrease in playground behaviors. Um, so teams that are really leveraging this data to make um, our schools just really respond to SEL needs for kids. Um, we're also using this data to look at what are critical needs for teachers in SEL work and in behavior work and in engagement work. Um, so we have used this data, I've used this data regularly working um, with restorative practices, with John Kidda, with Up for Learning, and with Joelle and thinking about what do teachers need right now um, based on some of the learning loss in SEL that we're seeing because of COVID, what do we need to focus on as far as wellness and community. Um, as I said, we're also using this data as EST teams to really look out, oh, sorry, thank you. Um, oh no, can you go one back? Thank you. Um, to really look at individual students. So when we're hearing kids pop up, um, both we're thinking about students who just are popping up, um, both from teachers bringing them forward to particular teams, and then we're also able to identify students who may have gone through and not been identified from teachers. Um, and so we're making sure that we're catching kids earlier and more proactive through this data use, and then we're really able to connect them with really particular and targeted SEL instruction to work on the needs that we're seeing based on the data. Um, and then the UES special teachers, another example of them just leveraging the data, they've actually decided to track um, changes in their responses. So every single week, the UES special teachers are looking at this data, looking at Swiss data and thinking about, okay, what is this data showing us? So what's the common language we're gonna use for this week? What is the particular SEL skill that we're gonna teach these folks? Um, and they're keeping that consistent. So every specialist teacher is using that same language and it's really, they're seeing really amazing um, positive impacts for behaviors in their spaces and to the point where grade level teams are also starting to leverage that same system. So good progress so far. So again, we're only two months in, so we're really thinking about a lot of this data as an early warning system and trying to show predictive factors, particularly when we're looking at attendance, which I'll speak to in a bit. Um, so we're really trying to grow the system. We know that there's still a few missing links, so we're really able to see sort of externalizing behaviors, um, and we really need to think about how are we catching those students who are disengaging um, and being more internalizers. So some of the behavior data, um, what we're seeing by and large is a lot of defiance, wandering, and technology use. Um, at three of our schools. And then RVS, I'll just put in a caveat as I was talking to Beth Kellogg, um, she, they're using the behavioral dashboard slightly differently over there. So she's only using it for when there are major behaviors versus at our other schools, we're documenting 
real teachers are using it on a regular basis. So I just feel like there's a really big discrepancy and that's certainly not accurate to what is happening and the behaviors that we're seeing at RBS. That is simply a reflection of the different ways the tool is being used. Um, but again, when looking at this data, we're really seeing just engagement um, being the main thing that we're concerned about right now with our students um, and how they're engaging in some avoidance behaviors. And so that's one of the focuses actually of a lot of the admin work um, and the work that we're doing to move that forward is how do we get kids engaged? How do we welcome them back into our community? And how do we ensure they have the SEL skills um, to be engaged and stay engaged in our communities? Um, in the data, free and students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch and students with disabilities are overrepresented in the students who have incidents in our systems. Um, I think some of that for students with disabilities is that there are some students who are on plans because we know that they have SEL needs and they have specific plans around SEL challenges and um, often they're monitored a little bit more. So, and I also want to just really reflect on that as a district because that's something that certainly we need to pay attention to. Um, just some of the examples, again, at the district level, we're really using this data to think about professional development needs for teachers. What are some of the skills and tools that we can support teachers in developing as we think about embedding SEL more and more into our world here at MRPS? School-wide, we're using this data and regularly reflecting on it to set expectations, use common language, and thinking about sort of school-wide responses to behaviors that we're seeing. And then the individual levels, we're using it to connect individual students with tier two and tier three interventions based on the needs that they're seeing. Can I ask a clarifying question? Sorry, before we move on to the next slide. What do those percentages represent? Oh, yes, it. good question. Um, so that's the percent of the total incidents that we're seeing. So out of 100% of the incidents, that have been yeah, yeah right. that's been recorded okay. in the dashboard. So out of like all of the incidents that have been reported in the behavioral dashboard, 72.5% at MHS are because of like defiance or wandering or technology use um, that I would frame as sort of avoidance behaviors. Do we have the number of incidents, or is that? Um, not off of the top of my head. I did not, yeah, but yeah. can we, for future? Yeah, yeah, I have that. So I know at UES, it's about 500. I, I'm not sure the other ones off of the top of my head. And I think that speaks to more of just teachers using this and it becoming a really regular part of their tools, um, which is right, like I think, I'm excited that we're seeing that many incidents because that means that teachers are actually using this to log behavior and we're able to have more accurate data to reflect on. I don't think it's just a measure of it being that we're having more behaviors. Does this mean at RBS, it seems like there's a difference of behavioral patterns with the vast majority being physical contact as opposed to? That's what to Jess was saying, that Beth is only logging only, okay. the okay. major Sorry, behaviors. Sorry. They weren't, the teachers aren't logging minor behaviors. Okay. So it was, so it, it looks different. It's just a different way to use it. Okay. Yeah. No, that's helpful. Thanks. Sorry, I missed that. consistently? Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, um, I think we realized what was happening. <laughs> and <laughs> is that the plan then? Because if I heard you right, that it's not, um, being used consistently, whether it's RVS or whether it's even UES, how they report and whatnot, right? So is that the plan uh, going forward, that at some point we'll use it consistently? Yeah, that's the hope the to sort of, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, but sorry. yeah, I think this is part of the learning that we're doing, right? We're only two months in. This is a brand new tool to a lot of these schools. Um, so thinking about how they're currently using it and how to get it so folks are using it consistently so that we can more have more meaningful comparisons across schools and across our district is gonna be really helpful. And that's just part of our work moving forward. One more thing, so in that, in that I'm, I'm thinking, I'm remembering some of the things you've shown us and I'm seeing like uh, a series of columns with different types of behaviors labeled and then there's sort of ones and zeros or type of thing. Um, are there, are those in minor, 
moderate and major behavioral also? And can this be broken out in that way? Or yeah, yeah. So I think um, EUES <coughs> with SWIFT has decided to only track major behaviors this year um, because they wanted to be really clear with what they were tracking. However, how different schools define major versus minor is something that we're still norming and creating consistency with, right? So what e RVS, they're tracking majors, and it's the majors that are going to Beth because they're physical contact to the principal. Whereas UES is only tracking majors, but they're majors that teachers are dealing with in the classroom. It's not just the physical contact that's going to the principal, for example. Um, and then MSMS and MHS, both, yes, so they're tracking both majors and minors, but we think we have a lot of work to do around clarifying and norming what the difference is and how we define that as a district. So it just didn't, why have that data? It didn't feel particularly helpful, if I'm being honest. It's getting there, it's a new tool. All right, attendance. Um, so Nick Connor and I spent a lot of time together, so hopefully I do him proud. Um, so just to sort of set context, um, chronically absent is 10% more of total membership days, so that includes uh, excused, unexcused, COVID-related, and out-of-school suspensions. So because we're only two months in to the year, that means it's only four days right now. So if you are absent for more than four, day, four days or more, you are automatically considered chronically absent. So again, we're using that as a predictive and hopefully preventative measure as we're thinking about attendance on November 2nd of the school year. Um, so if we, this graph is really just for show, I have bigger numbers on the next slide because those were hard to read. Um, so currently 27.4% of students in our district are chronically absent. So remember that is four days or more right now. That encompasses 313 students, which is just under the size of MSMS, just as a metric, and is about 4,000 days that have been missed already for students um, this school year. And we're again seeing free and reduced lunch as the highest um, rates of chronic absenteeism. So while only 27.4% of students are chronically absent, 40.3% um, of students who are free and reduced are chronically absent. So it's a pretty big spike based on class. And again, free and reduced lunch is a class economic factor. Um, so some of the ways that we're supporting and trying to be preventative in the future is really partnering with students and caregivers. Um, Nick, as I am sure you all know, does a fantastic job of partnering with families um, and encouraging teachers and other folks in our community to reach out to um, both students and caregivers when we're not seeing them in school. There's been a lot of collaboration and referrals to SEL teams now that we're building SEL EST teams um, that are really getting skilled at meeting kids in their SEL skills and matching them with the appropriate professional to support them. Um, we've been leveraging those teams to really think about some of the reasons behind chronic absenteeism and how to prevent that. Um, and Nick and I are working on an attendance um, campaign to help shift our sort of cultural knowledge and understanding of absenteeism coming out of COVID, right? Because that needs to shift again because there are some murky boundaries that needed to be murky and loose that we need to really think about why coming to school every day really matters and is important to our community now that we're trying to heal from COVID. Can you see also like breaking down uh, just free and reduce when you're putting the data in? Are you also, you know, like many of the art students also have intersectionalities around race and class and disability and ability. So are you able to see that data now or is that part of that same? Yeah, so some of that stuff I looked at, like for behavior, for example, when I looked at it, there was a pretty strong correlation between students uh, with disabilities and students who were eligible for free and reduced lunch. So 
one of the hypotheses that I had was that they were both overrepresented because they were the same students, essentially. Um, that hasn't been as true when we looked at the attendance data, and that is something that Nick and I spent some time actually today talking about, like, can we see the percent of students who are free and reduced lunch and BIPOC, um, and we just haven't gotten there yet, but it's possible. Thank you. Are there any, or is there any data or trends between, uh, like, chronic absenteeism and grades, like grade level? Yes, so it tends to. If you look on the all the fancy slides, oh yeah, go on back there. to the. I, I don't have back. to make it up. There you go. So yes, yeah. so this very tiny graph um, with the bars on it shows you the trends over time. Um, so there's a little bit more chronic absenteeism when we're thinking about the lower grades at kindergarten and first grade, and then it sort of goes up, and then it dips a little bit again in high school. And the one after that is students with IEPs. Yes. Yes. So students with IEPs are about 28%, um, which comparative to 27.4% is sort of right on track. Um, I think I'm accessing a uh, presentation. That's on agenda materials or board packet materials on, on our website, and our pre that presentation doesn't match this one, so just a note to like update it. Um, also, wondering about, do we know how the, so the absentee data, do we know how um, the chronically absent percentage compares to other school districts or the state? Do you have any not sense that. of that? I do not know that information. Yeah, school year. Okay. Yeah. And then do you know in years past if the trend is that that number drops or rises over the course of the year? It's a good question. We've never tracked it before. Okay. This is the first year we've tracked it, so we would yeah. be speaking off of assumptions. Yeah. Um, and it looked a lot differently last year when we were like, you got a sniffle, you stay home. Right. right? <laughs> well, and even this right. year, we're, people this year are still, still that yeah. Way too, yeah, yeah, and we're still very close in. I mean, my yeah. daughter had COVID. She was out for five days. Like, she would be considered chronically absent. She's not missed any other time at school. You know, so it's, a, right. it's still a little bit unique. But Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You may have said this, so I'm sorry for asking if you have um, what, What's Where does the four come from? Sir, when, where is the Where does the four, number four, comes from? What, like, why is four it four days, considered? Oh, uh, it's 10% of the total days you could have gotten to school this year so far. Okay. And on, it looks like, on average, it's three days. Like, we have 1,100 students, 3,900 days absent overall. That's three per kid, right? Um, so that's just close to the four days. So, Not yeah. quite exactly, because we track it for high school different. Okay. And Nick would, I don't know if Jason, you, do you know exactly how he so figured he, out how to do it? Yeah. Jason you know it, Jess? I do. So okay. he explained to me today in preparation for the school board Oh, meeting. sorry, Jess, go. No, that's okay. <laughs> um, so it, he tracks it by class and not necessarily by day. So that way we get a more accurate um, perception of total like instructional time. So I think there are four or five classes. Six. Six. Six times in a day. Yes. So Nick has done the math so that for high school students, he looks at total blocks missed and then divides that by the to get like the full day. So that way, it's tracked by class, and then he makes that division so that he can convert it into days. So it may be a student who, you know, missed one block every single day for six days and not necessarily a full day of school, but that still counts as one day of chronic absenteeism. Hopefully that clarified. Yeah, I, I'm, I was just trying to think that still, even though it's not a direct correlation, um, three absent days per kid on average, um, that's very close to four is what I was thinking. Um, district-wide. Yeah, district-wide, yeah, yeah, yeah. If four is chronic absence. Yeah, and remember, it's really early in the yeah. school year, so we just don't have that many total membership days yet. Jason's also looking at it super closely from our day-to-day -day conversation last week, or like they're looking at 
students are most chronically absent for certain periods at MHS each day. Mm -hmm. Why, like, and then the, the logical question is why is it, yeah. right? So they're, they're keeping a really close eye on that here, which we've never been able to do before. So like, that's the important thing to put out. Like we're, now, we're not only putting our eye on it, but we're talking about why and what we can do about it. Yeah, so again, I think one of our big successes so far is creating and really developing an SEL data system. A lot of this stuff is brand new. A lot of teachers are tracking using brand new databases and forms, um, and they've bought in, and it's been really, really helpful as far as looking at the data from a district school and individual level. So we're able, because of that data, really able to match student needs with professionals to move them forward in the SEL world and to really thinking about those lagging skills that individual students have and how to move them forward and then also how to do that on a class school basis as well. Um, we started a reflecting um, and again using data to really move our professional development work forward and thinking about next year, what do we need? Later this month, what do we need? Um, and the big term picture. Some of our learnings, um, it's pretty clear that free and reduced fo folks who are eligible for free and reduced lunch are at a pretty high risk for being chronically absent and for showing up on our behavioral dashboards. Um, so I think that's something that we really need to think about. It's something that we're attending to. Um, as Libby said, like Jason's working on that, Nick is supporting us and thinking through and really thinking about how to be preventative and how to make sure that kids are able to get to school and families are able to support students in getting to school. Um, we talked about this, but we really need to refine and norm our data use and how we use it and make it a lot more consistent across the district because it is being used so differently in different schools, which makes sense based on the fact that this is a brand new system. Um, I'm really excited about increasing SEL across the tiers. There's been some really intentional focus on tier three moving into this year, and I'm really excited to think about how to push SEL based on the data into all of the tiers and thinking about how to embed that more fully. Um, and then, of course, continuing to develop our SEL EST process, since that has been brand new. Um, we've done great work, really strong work, um, and there's certainly some more work that we can do to make sure that we're really pushing kids forward and moving them forward and supporting them and developing the SEL skills that we know they need to be successful. before we turn over to Pegasus. Mia? Jess, do you have any information from families when you know you or Nick or someone is talking to them about what it is that's keeping kids from coming to school? Yes, and I feel like I want to let Nick answer that question okay. on his own right because I want to protect him and all of the work that he's done and working with families. What percentage of the kids in the district are on free and reduced lunch? Uh, approximately 18. Okay, thanks. 18 students? 18 teachers across the like district. 18. Thank you. 18 to 20. 18 to 22. It's higher at Roxbury than it is at, in the Montpelier schools, but it averages out to around 18 to 22, somewhere in there. Okay, thanks. Yes. Um, some families who might qualify for free and reduced lunch, lunch, I understand, don't fill out the paperwork. Mm -hmm. Is that addressed? Does Nick have it opportunities to sort of help people with that? Or are there numbers out there that are missed? Oh, there's certainly numbers that are missed. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. The older the students are, the more it's missed. Yeah, and I think with the free meals that are happening, right, people aren't as likely to Aren't incentivized. Out. Yeah. for me? You're on, thank you. Yeah. I feel like I am between you and the track conversation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, the data that I have is a little different um, because right now we don't necessarily have um, data about students with disability as a whole and their progress because when we look at things like the longitudinal data, the reason that they have an IEP is because they're below grade level. So. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that we have to think about 
um, is how to start collecting data around how students are progressing, looking at individual progress and figuring out how to do that into group data. I don't know if that, I'm saying that right. But anyway, here's what I got. All right, so as of today, we have um, 143 students in the district, uh, pre-K to 12, that have individual education plans. I separated out K to 12 um, from pre-K because pre-K is its own beast and um, with all our partner programs and stuff, it really skews the numbers. Um, so this is right now what we have. Um, and we have 102 students currently um, K to 12 that have Section 504 plans. So. Um, looking percentage-wise, that means 11% of our K-12 students are, have an IEP. The national average is 14.5%. Um, that's based on last year. And the Vermont average is 18.4. So we are below average as far as students on, um, that have IEPs. Um, however, when we look at these two things together, so we're talking about students that are identified as having a disability, we're looking at 20% of our K-12 students. Um, what's the difference between IEP and 504? Sure. So um, an IEP, special education services, is they're under an entitlement law, and they are about students who are entitled to specialized instruction. And um, generally, they have some kind of modified curriculum. They have accommodations, but it really is a, an entitlement law. Section 504 is an access law. Um, that is an, it's a non-discrimination law that started um, after the Vietnam War um, and started as a workplace law that moved, it has moved into schools. And so students with Section 504 plans have a disability and they have accommodation plans to provide them equal access. So it's about looking at what is it that's a barrier to them accessing the curriculum at their grade level and removing those barriers through accommodations. So. Um, one of the things I thought about like a half an hour before this meeting, so it's not on the slide, but I do have it, is to look at what are the numbers that we've had in the last few years for IEP, so to kind of look at where that trend is at. Um, so 2018, there were 130, and this is pre-K to 12. Um, 2019, 124. 2020 was 128, and then we went up in 2021 to 138. And these are, this is a child count that is done every year in December, December 1st. So currently we are above that at 143, um, and we will have, I'm sure, more than that by the time we get to December 1. So we are definitely trending upwards right now as far as students that we are identifying as in need of special education. Oh, whoops, I'm not the one that's changing. I can change it on me, but that's not going to change it there. Um, this is just a graph that shows you um, by grade span um, where our IEPs and 504 plans are. As you can see, as particularly in the high school area, there's um, a much num higher number of students with 504 plans than students with IEPs. Um, so that's just information for you to know. This is looking at the facility um, where the students um, with IEPs are K to 12. And again, I pulled out preschool because of all the partner programs. Um, that's tricky. Um, looking at this, you can see the number of um, students with IEPs are at UES and at the middle school. Are those where the higher percentages are? Um, looking at where our professional staff are, I would say that is we have not dispersed our professional staff to equal those percentages. So um, part of the challenge is the current um, team teaching plan at UES. So there's a, a special educator at every grade level. And um, at the middle school, we actually are down. We are down um, three special educator positions right now in the district. And so we have a hole at the middle school. And so those special educators are doing a great job of picking things up. And we moved um, an interventionist actually um, from the intervention um, group in, to provide um, specialized instruction for students in reading this year to try to cover some of the gap that we have in um, our professional staff right now. When you say hole, we have those positions available. They're just yeah. not filled right yeah. now? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We just can't find them. <laughs> So if anyone's a special educator and for some reason you don't have a job right now, <laughs> send me an email. Um, so, so anyway. I'm sorry, I just have yeah. a question on that last slide. Um, sure. 
So I guess I would expect the number to be fairly consistent moving through the grade levels. Is there a reason why it's like roughly half when you get to the high school level? Do people lose eligibility for IEPs? So there is a, there is a requirement that you are reevaluated for an IEP every three years. Um, and so um, that potentially could be, I mean, the, the goal of an IEP, right, is to reduce that gap and get to a point where a student is able to access, access their um, grade level curriculum with accommodations. So, so if we are doing our job well, then we would want to see that happen. There are some students that, you know, with the more significant disabilities who are likely going to stay with an IEP throughout their um, education career, um, but that could be part of it. I think um, I haven't been here long enough to figure out what, if there's another reason for sure around that. Um, many of the, uh, there's a lot of students with 504 plans, right, at the high school, um, and I would say a lot of those are around mental health um, challenges uh, more than learning challenges. hands. I, my same question as always is this can this data be you know looked at in terms of race class and all of that to look at some of that representation? Um, it can yes yeah that, uh, that's gonna be part of hopefully a system that we get the systems that we have um, for special education paperwork and that kind of stuff, don't do that. So it, it will be a lot of uh, a lot of doing stuff by hand. Um, but yes, we can do that some. We will be able to do it size, maybe too small. Right. Just keeping that in mind. That's a good, particularly for race. Yeah. What's the outside MRPS? Yes. So that is. So we have um, some students that are placed by their IEP teams in independent schools. Um, if most of those independent schools are focused on um, students with significant social, emotional, behavioral needs. And so that is that um, those students as well as students that go to U32. So we have some students that have IEPs that are part of the exchange program. So they're still considered our they're students? St they're still our students, oh. yeah. We remain the LEA. We're still responsible for their education. OK. Yeah. Okay, um, this is looking just at the primary disability category for students with IEPs, um, and this is K to 12. Developmental delay is just a universal um, disability category for students that are three to six years old, so that um, once you get to six years old, then you have to look at the more <coughs> specific um, disability categories. Um, as you can see, looking at this, um, specific learning disability is where we have the most students with IEPs. Um, other health impairment is um, students with medical needs, but I would say the majority of those are likely students that are diagnosed with attention deficit disorder. Um, and then emotional disturbance is looking at anxiety, depression, and um, challenges with relationships and those kind of things. And then. We have autism. And then we have two categories, intellectual disability and speech language impairment, that those were too small to report. And size. Um, this was interesting <laughs> when I was looking at this. So um, as of yesterday, and I actually got more today, um, we had 21 new referrals for special education since the start of the school year. By comparison, last year at this time, there were only seven. Um, so um, that's an interesting trend to pay attention to. Um, most of those referrals are coming from parents. Um, the, when I was trying to look today to see what are, what are the reasons for those, I would say it's a combination of concerns about academic learning and then also the social, emotional, and behavioral um, challenges that um, people are concerned about their children experiencing. So um, that, is, that was just... I thought inf interesting information to share. Uh, next slide. Oh, wait, did I miss one? No, I didn't. OK. Um, one of the things that is new this year under the changes in the special education um, laws uh, or regulations 
um, is that there is a more formal uh, opportunity to uh, um, get parent input. So obviously parent input is a crucial part of any education plan, and it's something we've always done. Now the, um, the new regs require there to be actually a section in an IEP where we are identifying very clearly what um, parent input um, is towards the plan. And there is this, um, there are these questions that the AOE has given us that we are to ask students um, or parents following IEP meetings to get their feedback about the process. Uh, we decided um, in our district that we are actually giving these to all parents of students with disabilities after meetings also for 504 so that we can start to generate feedback around what's going well, what's working for families, what's not working for families. Um, so far, we've had under 10 responses, so when you look at these percentages, it's a small number. Um, but these are the questions that we are asking parents to reflect on um, after they're having meetings about their children so that we can look for, are there trends that we need to address as far as families feeling like they are um, being um, asked to participate in a meaningful way with their children's and their plan. So that was just a little FYI for you. The next slide, um, we have contracted with um, the Ability Challenge, which is an organization um, who has worked uh, some in Vermont. They actually helped the Vermont AOE write this very large document about um, eligibility changes. They've worked with the Burlington School District, and they are going to be completing an audit and needs assessment for us around the experience of, of children with disabilities in our district. So they will um, be doing surveys, and they'll be wanting to meet with administrators, teachers, families, and students. They're going to be doing interviews and focus groups, um, classroom observations. They want to observe our team meetings. They are going to want to look at all our documents, and then they'll be here for two days, and they've kept a third open just in case they need to be here for three days. But we're really excited about having them come and have someone kind of look at our district. One of the things that is a goal of mine is to increase the consistency of what special education looks like between our buildings. Um, there's a, there is a, lot, a big difference in a lot of what happens between our schools right now, which um, is, I'm sure, confuse, confusing for parents when you're used to one thing and then something totally changes. It might not feel like you can trust what's changing because it just feels different. And so um, we're really excited about, or at least I'm really excited, about the opportunity to have someone come in and just kind of look at our system and give us some ideas about what they think we need to move forward and uh, make sure that we are doing the best we can for students with, uh, with disabilities and their families. So I'm sure that I'll be reaching out to some of you to fill out some surveys and be interviewed. Report from them. So they're coming in January. I believe the report. Um, I think April, March or April is when the, on their timeline that we would get all that. Awesome. Thanks. Yes. So that is it for special education. And then um, I wanted. I also um, work with our multilingual learners, and um, just wanted to share. If you go to the next slide, just some statistics around um, the number of students we have. And I want to just point out the, um, the trying to change to a strength-based strength approach and thinking about these learners um, as emergent bilinguals, multilingual learners, because, boy, I wish I could speak more than one language. And so um, some of the, uh, what we see is really deficit focused, and I think we need to change the narrative around these students that um, are able to speak more than one language and learn in a language that's not their first language. It's pretty awesome. So, um, 53 students right now total um, in our district that are um, identifying in this group. We have um, 43 of them getting direct services from our um, teachers and then another 10 that are being monitored, have family supports or on watch. Um, so, and then I just thought it was really cool to see what the languages are that um, aren't these children um, are speaking natively in their families. So. I, not going to read it because I would probably butcher saying some of these words, but um, I thought that was just interesting. And that is it. Um, questions for Peggy? Thank you so much. Okay. You're welcome.
Yeah, what a great presentation. Yeah. Thank you. No, this is a fantastic collection of data. It really helps us get a good snapshot of what's going on. I wish it had its own meeting. <laughs> it was planned to have its meeting. It has had its own meeting. Now we, now we get Look to go into that. overtime. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, not only for the presentation, but it's just so um, comforting, I guess, might be the right word, to know that we have your brains behind all of this and the brains of other people who are not in this room. But just hearing the three of you speak to this um, is um, says a lot about what good hands our district is in. So thank you. I also want to give props to like how new so much of this is that you know it's surprising to know that we did not do this kind of work prior to um, the last four years. So I think we're just on such a great path towards improvement. Thank Mike you. Mike has been dedicated to this for a while. <laughs> a lot it's of, awesome. Lot of Mike Berry work right here. Yeah, a lot of Mike things Berry together. Work. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Thank really you. appreciate it. Thanks, ladies. It's, it's super informative. Maybe you forgot they were all here. That's the advantage of The track presentation and discussion. Don't we have oh, you know, quarter I, one financial report? Do we have quarter? Oh, we yeah. do have quarter one I'm financial I'm report. Gonna Amanda, I'm going to share that with you. Yeah. Maybe we can push that out until after the track conversation. I mean, I know it only it's only budgeted for five minutes. Let's push that out until after the. Let's push that out until after the track that. conversation because we have people who are have been extremely patient and I'm sure um, have places they want to go and get to. And <laughs> I I think. Time. Yeah. Um, and let's, unless people have objections, let's push the readings of A20 through A24 to the next meeting because I think people might want to discuss those and get some context and we may be stapling our eyelids open by the time we get to that. Yeah. And um, let's aspirationally leave the non-discriminatory mascots and school branding on because it's a mandatory policy and I think it's relatively straightforward. Um, and if for some reason we don't feel up to it, we can push that on too. Okay. So at the risk of derailing us, I wanted to offer an idea, yeah. given the feedback we've gotten so far. Um, it's clear that you know reasonable people can disagree about how to spend the surplus money that we have, and thanks to the quarter one financial report, we actually know we have $3 million in surplus, not $2 million. And one of the struggles that I've had with this conversation is the framing of now or never. Essentially, if we don't vote tonight, we won't have a track. And another is that when it comes to the surplus that we're incredibly fortunate to have, we've really only considered the one option. And I, I don't think that that's the case for our administration. I think. I believe that they have looked at this from many different angles, and I really do trust their work and their analysis. But as a board, we by narrowing it, this conversation to, if not now, never, and simply only considering the one option, I do believe that we have shirked our duty in one of our main roles of community engagement, and that has led to not having a thorough consideration and the result is that we have unintentionally privileged the perspectives and opinions of those who have had been a little bit more in the know over the course of the last year and a half and left the rest of our community sort of scrambling to catch up. And in the past two or three weeks, I believe we as a board have also sort of scrambled to catch up with ourselves and do some version of community engagement. I think what Libby and others in the administration have put together for tonight's presentation is fantastic and I really appreciate it. I also appreciate, Jim, the work that you did to put together the Front Porch Forum post and the time that you've taken to discuss this in depth with certain community members. Um, and Amanda's post in which she summarized the issue and then directly asked for feedback in a way that could be shared with the rest of us board members. 
Um, and I'm sure other members of the board have done other things that haven't been quite as you know, public um, that I don't even know about. But I still think that that has been a scramble and it has been ad hoc and kind of piecemeal. And you know, we've said that as a district and as a board, we really value equity and inclusion. And that doesn't only live in writing a policy about it or instructional materials or considerations for students living with disabilities. It also lives in how we conduct our business as a board. And um, it is not easy. And it does ask of us that we slow down um, and provide the space that we need for thorough consideration and openness to perspectives. And making sure that we're hearing and, and sitting with perspectives from people who don't have the same viewpoint, like literal vantage point that we have on this issue. And I certainly take my own responsibility for, for this. This is something that we could have put into place and started a year and a half ago and we, we didn't really put that into place. Um, after we received two, um, those two student, very compelling student presentations, one was on the track and one was advocating for net zero improvements. And I think we should also give ourselves a little bit of grace in this because we're not really very well practiced in making big decisions like this, other than outside of the very specific process we go through in establishing the annual budget. Um, so it's understandable that we would fumble our way through this. And I also think it's not too late. I still think we could do a process that doesn't have to take a very long period of time. We could definitely utilize the great work that the administration has put into um, that the presentation that we were going that we are planning on seeing tonight. But take that big step back, start from the beginning, and communicate that we actually have these unrestricted funds. Three million dollars is a lot of money, and we could be spending it in many, many different ways. We could offer those options of the different ways we could do it and have that more robust conversation over the next, I don't know, four weeks, six weeks. I don't think it has to take very long. And then, and, and, and really ha have that as like a listening sessions, you, you know, put out a real survey that, every, that we have time to digest the information of and, uh, and then deliberate after getting that and, 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 make a vote on how to spend this money. I definitely realize that this would be frustrating for everybody who's been advocating for this for a year and a half, and probably for some of my fellow board members, but I think that it is, of, I think it's, a, it's a valuable to conduct our business in a way that is um, thorough and thoughtful and, and allows the space for, for that full consideration um, rather than trying to meet a deadline that we might not even absolutely have to meet for the sake of that deadline. Um, so what I wanted to offer was that we, rather than having a, you know, a vote tonight, we um, direct that one of our committees designs and conducts that process for determining how to spend these excess funds and ask that it be completed by the end of the calendar year. So I could make a motion to do that so that we can have discussion about that, or we could, I don't, I don't know. I would like to second that. That is the process we're gonna go through to have the discussion. So, I definitely expected this in this order, in fact. Um, maybe actually after the presentation, but it makes sense. Um, I have seen a tremendous amount of misinformation out in the community, and people here suggesting that this is gonna raise their tax rate couldn't be further from the truth. There's a lot of information in the presentation that's here. Um, I don't see, there's no perfect process um, I don't see how extending a, a, a process that has gotten to be sort of contaminated with bad information is going to make it better. I think it's actually going to make it worse. Um, and I just think that there's, you know, I think that it's, 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 I think I would like to see a just, just 
just take a vote. I mean, like, you know, if it's I, if if people are uncomfortable moving forward, or uh, then then don't. I just I just don't see how extending the process further is going to make it better. I see it making it more convoluted, giving more opportunity for misinformation and just falsity and 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 rudeness and harm essentially that's coming towards us from certain members of the community i don't want to be subjected to that i know it's going to happen if we make a vote one way or the other but i'd like to move past it um and i'd like to get on with work that i know we need to do um that's that's how i feel about it i really and i can be in, a, in the minority but that's that's how i feel I, that I would very much still like to see that at least maybe quickly, but I would like us to actually take the time because we can't speak out of both sides of our mouths where we ask for information. We have a whole bunch of information that's been prepared for us, and then we're not even going to consider it. I'd also like to remind us that we already voted on using our fund balance, the $1.5 million, back in April after a very compelling presentation from a lot of these same people. And I am not willing to go back on the agreement that we made, I'm not unvoting on that. So from my perspective, what we are trying to consider is, and we do actually, if anyone actually wants to bother to read it, Anna has put together a fantastic multi-page list of all the times we as a board have talked about it, made actions on it. I'm really disappointed and upset by the amount of information and how personal and unhelpful it has become because it really allowed the conversation to get clouded. I don't need to go any further, but I just want to remind us that on a in April, in June, we heard from our community and we actually voted unanimously to support using this very small piece of a very helpful little savings account that we happen to have for a very dire need in our community. If nothing else has compelled folks to this, the gentleman saying the parents are out there painting the pieces and the students are having to work on their own track. I mean, come on. It's, it's a track for our students. And you do. Any day of the week you come here and you see students on that track. There's girls on the run for elementary and middle school. This is a major investment. 20% of the entire middle school population does track. So, I'm so I feel very strongly, I do feel like we've taken the time. I, we have definitely learned some lessons about better community engagement, absolutely. But I do think we have done our due diligence. There has been a subcommittee of the board that has had multiple communications that are open to the public about the track. We should also be allowed to ask questions about, well, while we're digging up the track, what if we fix these things? And unfortunately, that opened up a floodgate of a lot of misinformation, lesson learned. But that being said, I want the community to understand we as a board need to be able to ask these questions. That is very different than making a decision. We can ask the question, how much is it going to cost to replace the lighting? How much would it cost to fix the turf? How much would it fix to fix the parking lot or the auditorium? We need to be able to ask those questions and not being attacked for asking the questions. That is very different than taking a vote. And we take using the community's money incredibly seriously. We are missing time with our families. We've been cleaning the school during COVID. We have dedicated hours and hours and hours because we absolutely care about and take seriously our responsibility to use the community's money. I think I'm done. Thank you. I mean, I just want to say a few things. One, I mean, I do think the process on this has been perfect. I also think that we, we, do, we don't have a prescribed process for this. I mean, we don't have a prescribed process for, for doing something like this. My inclination is to follow the lead of the administration. The administration knows their needs, they knows the priorities. They know what the investments have been made. They've been educating us on the revenue streams. They've been educating us on how things have been funded. And if the administration feels there are competing needs for this money, I want the administration to explain it to us, and I want us to go through the process of making a decision. I am very reluctant to have a choose your own adventure on how to spend $3 million with the community. I think that is a recipe for a community food fight and for misinformation. I think if we put up straw proposals, I mean, here's, here's a instance. We have spent a lot of money on putting props behind our, our academics in light of COVID with the ESSER money. We've gone through a very public process on that. If we create the impression that this money can be spent on, you know, quote unquote, learning loss, which, which definitely exists, but we've also addressed the ESSER funds. Um, I think the community debate will be, if we pull back on that and don't do it, that we don't care about learning loss because we haven't spent that money. If we put up 
you know, certain proposals and then take them down for the purpose of putting up a straw proposal, you know, in a theoretical situation. I just think that's a huge recipe for more and more misinformation. I think we saw it with our consideration of the turf field. Um, I think that was an honest consideration. It was brought actually through the process that we had because community members came to us and they said, you know, here's something we want you to consider. We considered it. Um, and it created a lot of misinformation. And not that it's a bad thing, but I think if we're going to have a process like that, it should come from the administration saying, we have three or four different ways we want to spend this money and we want community input on it. We're not getting that from the administration. The administration is, is instead telling us, here's the funding streams, here's our priorities, these are being taken care of. So it's been an imperfect process, I apologize for that, but I think, I think creating process for process sake and in a manner that could create a lot of misinformation and false promises to the community, I don't think that services us well. Um, and I think we should have a discussion about how we go through a process like this again because this is a unique situation. It's, you know, it's not a bond. I'm kind of comparing it to the bond where, you know, the administration came to us, you know, this was several years ago, with a whole bunch of needs. We didn't ask the community if they agreed with those needs or not, but we obviously, you know, went to the community with a bond, but then explained why the $5 million was there. We didn't have a process of, if we went with a $5 million bond, what we wanted to suspend it on. The administration told us what those needs were. And I think we should take the cues here. The administration should tell us what the needs are for this money. We should listen if we feel it's a justified need. Um, I think we should move ahead. And if we feel that there are questions about whether the need is justified, let's ask those questions and have the administration explain it. And if it presents a situation where we need more community input to, to make a decision, Let's do that. But I, I want to hear from the administration about what their priorities are and how they feel the money should be spent. And then I think we should make a decision about whether or not make, that makes sense and justified to the community. And I also want to make very clear, this is a real gift expenditure. The tax implications here are essentially, essentially nothing. Um, and I also want to put it out there, just practically, is there anyone on this board who feels that the current track is in a satisfactory condition and we're, not, we're going to do nothing and just let it deteriorate? I mean, the, the track's an embarrassment. Um, and I know that I might be seen as, as a track fan. I, I'm not, I mean, I'm a runner. Nathan, do I run on the track <laughs> ever? <laughs> I avoid the track like the plague. It's boring as hell. Um, but. I know what it, I know the benefit that it brings to you know the great kids that are in this room, the kids that are coming up, the the 80 kids at middle school. I also know, and you know, there's there's been this this thing in the community about you know let's spend on wellness and mental health. There's really no better way than than increasing extracurricular activities for you know to deal with wellness and mental health and to build community, to build confidence, to build all those things. Um, I spent the last couple summers in Iceland, and Iceland has done this amazing thing. They had a huge um, substance abuse and other problems in teenagers driven, you know, oftentimes by the stress and anxiety they were, they were dealing with. They made a huge countrywide investment in, in, in extracurriculars and facilities. There are 1,000 people towns in Iceland that have nothing around them, that have much better facilities than we do. Over an 18 year period, they've seen a drop in, in extreme alcohol use and alcohol abuse, you know, from in 15 to 16 year olds from 40% to 5%. They've seen a drop in cannabis use from 17% to 7%. In daily smoking from 20% to 3%. I mean, granted it was with some other measures, they've also seen a participation in sports increase from 23% to 46%. So these investments in extracurricular activities are some of the best investments in mental health and well-being we can make. Um, and we oftentimes skip the preventative side of these investments and look at the treatment side, but this is an investment in community. It's an investment in, in our kids' health, both physically and mentally. It's an investment in um, the great efforts of, of Nathan and Dylan and Dan Vosian, and I'm forgetting a bunch of other people who've, who've spent time with these kids and built this program basically for free. Um, and it's also an investment in increasing our tax base. I mean, we have people who are coming to central Vermont, looking for a place to live, looking where their kids, where they want to bring their kids to school. And we all know 
that each student we bring to our district, our taxes go down. When we increase our, our per, per pupil uh, numbers, our taxes go down. And when we have a mud pit that's supposed to be a track and people are looking at facilities and they look at you know, U32 or South Burlington or Essex or CVU or MMU or all of our competitive schools and they've invested in their facilities, it tells them something. And that brings tax dollars and the needed families that we want moving into our district out of our district. If you have someone who cares about facilities and wants a high school that looks like it belongs in the 21st century, they're gonna to go to Middlesex, not Montpelier. And we have to be cognizant of that. This is, this, is, this is on its merits a very easy decision. And there's been a lot of confusion and there's been a lot of community pushback. And I, you know, and unfortunately, you know, some of it came from, you know, from Grant exaggerating the, the clawback risk. I apologize for that. But that still does not take away from the merits of, of this project. So I really wanna hear from the administration. If there are computing, competing resources for this funds that we really have to be worried about, let's hear about them. If not, this is, this is a great one-time investment in our community and our kids. It's gonna have a 20 to 30 year payback. Um, and like, frankly, I mean, I hate to use the word no-brainer, but this is a no-brainer investment of funds. Looking at all the months and months ahead and how this came out, ah, and I stumbled upon a training we got around white supremacy culture. Um, and Mara, one of her little quotes said, Cowardice as the question. Is it safe? Experience as the question. Is it politic? Vanity as the question. Is it popular? But conscious as the question. Is it right? And there comes a time when one must take a position that is neither safe, nor politic, nor popular, but that feels right. And this is not against the track. I wanna be very clear. I have not slept in weeks. I have thought about this left and right. I love running, I love the benefits, but I have a lot of questions. One is the process. And we need to be humble and say we messed up. The process was not right. We had plenty of opportunity to say to the public, this is what we're doing, and we said, we've heard enough. We had enough from 31 people. There's a danger of that single story that you all know a lot, that we've been talking about this for a year and a half. That's not my story, because I didn't. I'm not in this facilities committee. I'm not in the financial committee. I've seen two reports in the infrastructure and so the story that I have is very different than the story that Jill might have, who is talking to the kids in the track, in the soccer field. That is not my experience, right? Like the community that I talk to is very different. And that's what makes this board great. You're an athletic, that's great. I stumbled to run one mile once a three months and feel proud of myself for it. You know, like that's not the community that I talk to are community of parents who have come here too to say, hey, our kids are struggling on special ed. Hey, our kids are struggling on bullying and harassment. Hey, that's the community that I am mostly in touch with all the time. So I think for me, this danger of we did enough, we listened, we, you know, here's all the people that came. I wanted to hear from the people that didn't come, that didn't know that this happened. And I, it's an anxiety that it creates. For you, maybe the process is enough. For me, it wasn't enough. For me, this process is enough. I wish I could have spent time with the students and say, hey, let's look at the, at the big picture. Let's look at these needs, these needs, these needs. Yes, we want to do the track. Is this a decision we have to make today? You know, I was also, there's a little bit like this vote of this one million. It was misleading, right? Like, and. If you look at the recording, I said, I am voting with the full understanding that I can change my mind once we look at this big picture, that this is for auditing purposes. I would have voted no, because I still think that the process, that we have an opportunity as a board to think cohesive about the big picture. I was in that same training that Libby was at the report. One of the things that I see is our job is to be looking from the top down to the whole picture. 
I don't like to be at the top. I like to be in the bottom and look up. That's just my, my way. Looking at the big picture. And I don't feel like don't have all the information. We have a special uh, report or audit that's going to come up. We, looking at all of this, like the presentation today was great. We still got a lot to learn to be able to see. Again, this is not against the track. It's saying, let's build a system. You've been here seven years. You know the track. Why do we have $3 million? We could have planned this. This is going to be a need. We need to plan this ahead. This is the way that collectively we need to start looking at the way that we manage the school funds. It's like the big plan of the great report that the facilities uh, committee has done, the fact that we need some ADA accessibility at Roxbury, that, that should be one of the things that we need to look at. It's like, yes, I want to hear, it was the first time, and, and then when I read, I've never heard the administration say, this is a must, we must do it. It's part of, like, here are all the things we could do. And so, was it a lack of the process for the infrastructure committee that I heard this 15 times and didn't come here to report only once that this was going to happen and it was going to have to move? That is... And important, I'm going to end by saying I do believe this white supremacy culture sense of urgency, we need to decide. You need to decide on this vote of $2 million, and then you need to decide if construction needs to happen. We need to rethink the way we work together. There's the way that we can think about, so the antidotes for working on this is realistic work plans based on the lived experience of the people, okay? Leadership who understand that everything takes longer than anyone expects. A committed to equity, including commitment to this cause and plan for what it means to embed equity in this. One of the things that I am struck by thinking about disability, and then I was looking at our website, we have this great program of unified sports. There's also, and then I brought these questions before, when we're looking at the track, are we thinking about how to include students with disabilities in our track and field, not as a unified sport, but as an adaptive sport. And there's all kinds of information out there. And I asked the question, when we're putting out the track, are we thinking of uh, students uh, in a wheelchair? We're, you know, all these decisions is not for today or for your kids, but seven years from now. How are we thinking about, about in this inclusion in there? And those are, you know, questions that maybe you guys already have in there, but I'm not taking this lightly, and I'm not saying no to the track. I'm saying let's think through this, and if we decide here, this is the plan, this is how we're going to allocate this track. Nathan talked about um, borrowing equipment. Like, do we need to add equipment to this thing? Like, what, are, what is the, you know, we're doing this, two million is also bare bone, right? It's just that. Is that track? Is you're buying equipment with the two million too. So, I I think, I, the fact that you're saying, the community is going is fighting. It's okay. That's our job to listen to discomfort. Being uncomfortable. It's okay. I am okay for people that don't agree with me. I am okay. This is part of the process. We have to be okay. The students have to be okay to, for us to be here disagreeing in something so important. Um, at the risk of not being as articulate as the rest of my board members who seem to have come very prepared <laughs> with lots of notes, um, I did want to just weigh in. Um, you know, I agree with everything that has been said from everybody. And so it's, and uh, mostly that I really welcome a robust public input process. So the fact that, you know, whatever misinformation or um, ideas that were sort of spread or sparked from the question of adding the turf to the project, um, you know, that for me was a welcome part of the process because at least it got people involved. And before that, people weren't really involved. Um, we weren't hearing from a lot of people that are, were outside of the track community. So now as board members, we've been able to see a public debate unfold online. We've been able to receive 
maybe 100 emails, wasn't counting. But um, if anyone didn't read through the policies that are on the agenda tonight, it's because they were reading email and input from all of our constituents. So to me, like any democratic process is improved with public input. And it has definitely helped me you know, understand where the community is at on this issue. And if it, one of the first questions I asked when we talked about this a long time ago was, you know, I'm super supportive of improving our facilities. Um, but I was wondering if it really aligned with the community's values. And, you know, I think it does, but I also saw that there was a lot of um, misinformation and a lot of fractions of our community that that didn't feel like they were involved in the process. And I don't see why we can't make space for those conversations to happen. And that was the question I asked at the last board meeting was, I was trying to get to the bottom of what is the urgency of a vote one way or the other today at the last meeting or today at this meeting. Um, and we spent some time discussing that at tonight's facility and energies committee meeting with Andrew really trying to get at the heart of, you know, we've already sort of earmarked this 1.5 million, so why is it so urgent that we make the vote on the additional $400,000 tonight? And after a little bit of question and answer session with Andrew, and I don't want to um, misrepresent what you said, but it sounds to me like there may be sort of a middle road diplomatic path forward that will both allow for potential groundbreaking of the track in spring of 2023 and time for us to engage our community a little bit more on at least the misinformation, at least giving our community enough time to um, ask the questions that they feel haven't been answered and then for us to respond to a lot of the obvious misinformation that um, has occurred in the public dialogue. And that would be to approve funding to move forward with the engineering process and the design process of the track to create um, sh what Andrew described as shovel-ready plans for a track. And that would be an investment that if we never fix the track, which I don't think we want to do, I don't think we never want to fix the track ever in the next five years or 10 years, I think there will be a time when we want to put a new track in. Um, it will allow us to have those plans in place for a shovel-ready project. And if we're able to, over the next few months, engage the public in a dialogue that everybody feels comfortable with and that the community can get on board with and that my fellow board members you know, um, feel has answered their questions and concerns about the process, which I agree with them on, um, then we could potentially break ground in spring of 2023. And it's sort of a yes and solution. So I think that that's something that we should have in the back of our minds as a potential solution for tonight's vote. That it, it feels to me like we would only need another couple of months um, to really engage the community around this conversation. Um, and just like on, on my very gut level, like riding my bike in tonight and listening to <laughs> all of the cheers from the crowd, I have never heard such loud cheering from any crowd um, unless I was in like a, a full professional sports arena. So, you know, I think what, when we think about our students and you talked about it tonight, you know, we're here to educate the whole student. We're here to encourage um, students to grow on every level in their life and not just what happens in the classroom, although I find that to be very important. And I was a public school, high school teacher. Um, and so I really value that. But I also really value things that build community and engage our learners in all aspects of their life. You know, things like prom is very important to children. And <laughs> things like being involved in sports or, you know, my daughter's doing a theater thing and we've invested in the theater in the auditorium here at the high school. And I've seen the immediate benefits of those investments in the program that Kiana has built here. And um, 
and it's really beautiful to see. And we've done huge improvements with the basketball court, you know, and when you go in there as a spectator now, it feels really different. You know, that space feels really different and it's exciting. Um, and it gives the students a sense of pride and a few times it was mentioned like the capital city thing. And it does, you can't help but compare yourself to the surrounding schools a little bit. And as a mom of a, I mean, I never played sports, so I'm very unbiased when it comes to that stuff, but, um, and I never would have imagined myself, you know, um, in my school that I graduated from, you know, rooting for sports and trying to spend money on sports. But here I am, I mean, um, yeah, I'm not sure where I was going with that exactly, but. But it's, it's um, our job isn't just to teach kids, it's to support kids on a very holistic level. And I felt that tonight as I drove in and I want to continue to improve the sports facilities of this town. I think where I was going with that is my son plays sports now and I've had the opportunity to travel all around the state and even into um, neighboring neighboring states and it is embarrassing like it just is um, it's not embarrassing anymore you know our basketball courts aren't embarrassing our bathrooms aren't embarrassing anymore so there's there's things where we've improved our facilities but you can't help but walk into these surrounding schools and be like wow this is sort of an embarrassment of riches compared to our district thank you that was actually quite articulate um, uh, others before Libby gives her presentation, Merrick? Um, yeah, so if it's not already clear, I think I speak for most students, including those who are not in track when I say that. Further delays of this vote aren't helpful. And I mean, even if we go through another listening process, another feedback process, I think it's very likely that this, the feedback we would receive would be from the same types of people that we, we received in the last processes. I, I, I don't think the people who haven't come forward so far are going to in another engagement session. So that's just why I don't think it's really helpful. I think that um, we've, we've had a very robust um, engagement with the community. We've had a lot of voices shared and I think it's just, I think it's just time to have the vote. I don't think another delay is helpful. I feel like, like we should continually look to improve our processes, um, but at the same time, I don't feel like that should get in the way of progress and stop projects altogether. Um, and also, like we're, we're a small community. We had a newspaper article about a $5 million plastic field. If you, know, you were concerned about money or the environment, you definitely heard about that. So I feel like more time, like Merrick said, might not get additional valuable feedback. Facilities and Energy uh, Committee meeting tonight, something that I was talking about tonight, and I know we heard a lot of public comment on that. <clears throat> this felt like merely a facilities investment, and I do not agree with that, and I feel that our facilities really become our student experiences, and what we choose to invest in, in, in terms of our facilities, are the kids, are, are who our kids become, um, so I just want to, I want to broaden kind of, you know, the, the public thinking too, just around, it's, it's not just, you know, it just, it feels like very um, one dimensional thinking when we just say a facility, this is, this is much, much more than that. This is an opportunity. I know our kids are coming out of a incredibly unique and difficult time. And I think that our district has worked very hard so far, and I think it can be seen here tonight in the capable hands, like we've talked about, that our district is in, in terms of our, our academics. Um, and I think that we've also talked about that there is a real significant need for us to invest in the community and the wellness, the physical wellness, and me mental and emotional wellness of our students. And I feel that this project absolutely represents an investment in that. Um, I do wonder, so if we're talking about kind of dispelling myth, we're talking about making sure that we are 
fact over fiction if the upcoming presentation is going to help to highlight some of that and moving into that, and, and I would agree, I think that we do need to have a process. We have an additional one and a half, almost $2 million beyond this $1.5 million in the fund balance, if my numbers are correct, and that we do need to define a process for how we are going to, to attend to that. But I personally don't make sense, I don't think it makes sense to kind of undo all the work that we have done so far. Um, we have heard from, a small number of Roxbury families, but what we have heard from people is um, a resounding support to go ahead with this project. I think specifically for Roxbury students having a positive landing uh, in, in Montpelier, it's, it's these kinds of experiences and opportunities to really do the relationship building that happens in our extracurriculars is really, really important for our community. And to see the numbers of participation and to see that going up, up, and up, and up, and to know that we have, you know, at least this year, we have an opportunity for transportation for our students who want to participate um, feels really positive for the community that I am here representing. Um, so I would like to see, you know, have the opportunity to hear the presentation. Let's like, you know, discern fact from fiction. And I would like to see us, you know, develop a process in moving ahead with the remainder of the fund balance and not not just kind of put all this work by, by the wayside and to move forward with, with um, a signaling or a vote or what it means to be this evening. I, I didn't mean to spot. I'm sorry? I said I didn't mean to give you a <laughs> that's okay. There's nothing here I can say that, that's going to add to the conversation, but um, the only thing I, 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 I agree that we should hear from the administration that put a presentation. I don't, I don't see a reason why we shouldn't. Um, and we represent the community and you know we've heard from the community and we've heard different opinions. I personally think that if we do vote, which I think we should, that's gonna represent that, right? So I, I don't understand the, the reason let's not vote because that's where the community is. So community is not 100% behind this. I get it. So we might not be 100% behind this, but, but you know, what's 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 the point of not voting? Um, especially if if this is the first time we're talking about it, I, I get it. This is not the first time we're talking about it. Um, we have have talked about it, and I, I understand I understand the concerns that we may not not we may not have gotten all the information, or not everybody would have had chance to look at it and all that stuff. I I do get it, but yeah. It's, Again, there's nothing I can say that hasn't been said before, so. <laughs> Should I say, before we go on, I apologize to those at home. We lost our internet for a little while in the district. The network went down at a very inopportune time because that was an excellent discussion. Um, but I apologize to the people at home. And I believe you were, you were still videoing that conversation, <laughs> correct? Yeah, so it will be available to the public, but that was miserable timing on our internet's part. So and I'm thank sorry. you for the impromptu tech support. Yeah, <laughs> behind the scenes. <laughs> I'm rather embarrassed that that happened. Yeah. Anyway, should we go move on with the presentation? You can't control it. Yes, the please internet. do. All right. yeah, no, it's not the first time it's happened. Yeah. So. Um, when I was putting this together, I wanted to put, because of the misinformation that was um, just discussed in the public, I wanted to put infrastructure spending in a funding context um, for everybody. So, Amanda, you can keep moving forward there. Thank you for being my Vanna. Um, so, in general, there are three different funding sources when we're talking about infrastructure. This is every year. This is not COVID specific. This is not ESSER specific. This is every single year when the school board decides on a budget and the, and the communities vote on it. There's the local budget. This local money, it's a tax dollars that we collect from our community. Um, it's basically our yearly budget process, right? So in FY23, infrastructure spending within our local budget was approximately 10% of that budget cost. So the year we're in currently. And what do we use that for? We use it for general upkeep, uh, classroom renovations, general buildings and grounds updates, just the general things that we know happen every single year. They're routine, they're expected. We know we plan for them um, as just general upkeep of our facilities. That's what primarily the community's taxpayers' dollars pay for. Andrew, yeah? Yeah. 
Then we have our capital plan, which is also something the community votes for in a separate article in our in on town meeting day. Um, and in that capital plan, this is a relatively new piece to the community. It's, I believe the first year that we did a capital plan was my first year as superintendent five years ago and Andrew's first year as bu uh, buildings and grounds. Um, this is also local money. It's voted on on town meeting day. It is considered part of our local budget, although it's a separate vote from the community. And that last year represented 1% of our budget. And in the capital plan, this is to avoid big bonds going in the future, because we, we're currently, Christina, we have three bonds that we're paying back currently. Um, so the idea of a capital plan was to, to try to decrease our reliance on bonds. Um, this is for larger infrastructure needs that are planned. So for example, we did all the bathroom replacements that somebody referenced earlier, um, roofing here at MHS. We have plans for the next four, four fiscal years, five fiscal years, for window replacement at UES and MSMS. Um, we've done gym renovations um, over at MSM last, MSMS last year with our capital plan. Um, we have a plan that's part of our budget presentation that you can see from last year's budget presentation, and you'll see again this year budget presentation, a plan in place that goes through FY28. Um, for that money. After FY28, we do not have plans for that money. So when we get into the future that Andrew was referencing the last budget or the last board meeting around what are potential future needs, keep in mind that in five years we're going to have $260,000 um, not planned for and that we have time in the next five years to plan for what we use for that. Capital plan also rolls over. If we don't spend it, it stays in that account for us. So a capital plan can grow if we don't spend it. We have plans to spend it, right? So we budget for that amount of money. And then state and federal grants. So this happens to be where ESSER comes in. There's a supply chain assistant this year. This year, Efficiency Vermont had a state grant. We're not sure if that is actually from federal money or if that was state money. Um, and what we did with that is a lot of air quality work, infrastructure around air quality needs, getting needed PPE for our staff and our, and our students, um, and some larger renovations that we'll go into. Um, ESSER does have requirements for expenditures outside of infrastructure that is well detailed in our ESSER plan on the website. It's also linked in this presentation. Um, and we went through a lengthy process around how that is, is funded. So when I'm speaking of ESSER funds here, I'm speaking of just what's in the infrastructure piece of the ESSER funding. But there, that is a much larger pot of money that we're spending a lot of other, we're doing a lot of other things from. For instance, our talk space commitment for a pilot for the next two years, um, the virtual mental health services, that's also coming out of ESSER. We have interventionist positions in ESSER. We have a lot of professional development for high quality teaching in ESSER. Those kind of, like a lot of things are in there and I encourage people if they haven't looked at our public plan for the ESSER money to go look at that plan because you'll get more information than just what you're going to get tonight on that. Go ahead, Amanda, thanks. <clears throat> so what are some of the completed or planned projects within these three funding sources? Within our local budget, we have recently com completed yearly classroom renovations. Andrew has talked to the board a lot about that. We do approximately four classrooms a year um, in terms of renovations, doing the paint, the flooring, major clean. Um, MSMS, UES, and RVS all got updated bathrooms. The ceiling and lighting at MSMS was done through the local budget. Stairwells at MHS, MSMS, and UES were done at the, at, with the local budget. What's planned, that's part of our budget conversation that we're having right now um, as an administrative team. So using local budget funds, that, that's part of our conversation we're having right now. The board will see what we plan for the next local budget when we present the budget the first meeting in December. In terms of our capital plan, the roof, the MHS roof was completed in 2019. MSMS bathrooms was completed in 2020. MSMS basketball court, um, or I'm, yeah, basketball court mm -hmm. uh, was completed in 2021. The UES sensory room was done in 2021. Uh, I guess we have the gym. Oh, the basketball court for outside, sorry, with all the drainage problems. Yeah. Um, that was done. Uh, the gym was also done 21, 22, and the UES multi purpose room in 2021. Um, with the capital plan dollars. The future plan, again, in the budget presentation from last year, will also be in the budget presentation for this year, is the UES Auditorium, which of course is, has desperate need for a facelift and will be a tremendous community resource uh, for a small theater for both our students and community members. 
um, in the arts once that's completed because it is a beautiful space. Um, the MSMS UAS windows will be done, which is a very needed infrastructure project that we've talked about at length at board meetings. That will be done through 2028. Is that wrong? Well, I, I just want to make sure you had it. It wasn't just next year. Yeah, <laughs> I just no, want to no, make sure no. you had multiple it's years in that one. 2028, because <laughs> it's a longer term project. We're doing, we're doing some windows at a time. Um, and then at MSMS, we have plans in the capital plan for the sustainability program, which is probably one of the most innovative programs in the state right now to really redo that classroom so it's even more innovative for our students at MSMS. Um, and also the STEAM programming that is in its first year at MSMS to produce student leadership voices and choice in a different way than what we've traditionally done at MSMS. That will be happening 2023-24. As planned in the capital plan. The state and federal grants, we've already completed a whole bunch of HVAC improvements and uh, direct digital controls to bring us into the 21st century there. Um, and air, we've had air purifiers for every classroom, that kind of thing for PPE and, and also PPE and that kind of stuff. What's planned for future federal grants in UES, we have the little gym renovation, which is in desperately big facelift as well. We're working with uh, Max and Emmanuel down there around little gym renovations. The special education suite at UES is right now an adult space, and we want to move it into an instructional space. So that is in plans to use with ESSER 3 money as well um, for our students with special needs at Union Elementary School. At Main Street Elementary, um, we desperately need a playground that fits the adolescent need to give our adolescents something more to do at MSMS during recess. We all know the cafeteria and kitchen needs a, needs a good renovation at MSMS that is also within the ESSER plan um, to provide more room and also more usable space for our chefs there. And the Thrive space has already received a renovation that should have already been completed. Sorry, that's in the wrong spot. Thrive, Thrive is our um, program that we're building right now for students who have significant skill building needs in social emotional learning. So that space has been completely renovated. That's in the wrong spot, and I apologize there. It should have been in the recently completed because it was done this past summer. At MHS, um, we have a need for a special education um, life skills transition classroom. So this is a classroom that's upstairs and need a sink so we can teach kids how to cook. We can teach kids those life skills that they're going to need once they graduate from us uh, so they can have more independent living. Um, for students with significant special needs. Um, so that's all within our ESSER plan in terms of infrastructure. We went through a long process of what our needs were around that piece, um, and I think that's an excellent use of those funds that are going to benefit not only our students, but also our community. Go ahead, Amanda. Um, in terms of federal grants, the ESSER infrastructure, this is just pulling it out a little bit more. With it. We've gotten three ESSER grants, one, two, and three. One was primarily spent on classroom multicultural um, classroom libraries uh, for Main Street Middle School. We spent $100,000 on new texts for kids um, at Main Street Middle School for classroom libraries. We also, at that point in the in the pandemic needed more one-to-one -one laptops for kids because they were breaking, <laughs> they were using them, they were at home and stuff, so we brought a lot of one-to-ESSER -one laptops with, with ESSER 1. That's why it's not on here, it didn't really have to do with infrastructure. Although it was a long time ago, so I just wanted to remind people of what we did with that. ESSER 2, that's where we brought the hydronic valves, outdoor air damper control units. These are words I've never truly said before outside of board meetings, control modules and control wiring, which Andrew has gone through. Um, a, an in-depth plan with our engineers as to how to get our HVAC systems working to their max capacity. So we have the best air flowing through our systems, which of course is important during COVID. And then our ESSER, that's the link to the full plan. We've already, I've already gone through those pieces, but just so we can see which ESSER grants paid for what um, was important. So let's talk about that fund balance that we have. And this is going back really to basics, just what is a fund balance? And in the most basic sense, it's our savings account for surplus money. So it's money that's been budgeted for in our local budget. We've received that money from the tax base and it wasn't spent for a variety of reasons. This, and the fund balance can accumulate across several years. 
Okay, so it really is a rainy day savings account for whatever reason. If we come out with, a, with money that's a surplus at the end of our year, our auditors help us figure out what that is and they put it in the fund balance. It is a well-documented thing in every one of our, doc, our auditing reports. I know this because Christine and I spent about four hours yesterday digging into the past six years of auditing reports to try to determine exactly what the reason why we have such a large fund balance. At the most basic level, you know, it's just there's a variety of reasons. And the pandemic has thrown us for a loop on what we budget for versus what we spend for the past three years. Um, and in, while it could be poo-pooed, substitute teachers, we literally didn't use substitute teachers for a full school year. Mm -hmm. Like, not once. But we had them in the budget, right? So that is a significant expense that if we did, we budgeted for that money, we thought we were going to need it. The pandemic told us differently. We <coughs> potted people up with two adults in every classroom. There was no need for substitute teachers. So that pot of money, doesn't. we don't lose that. That goes into the fund balance. Um, but for a more specific amount of keep going, for more specific, this is what our, our auditors say. Um, in 2017, um, which was pre-merger and pre-Libby as superintendent, we, our fund balance amount was $1,795,000 essentially. In FY18, it dropped a little bit. We, were, we spent in a deficit that year, right? So what was the reason why it dropped $394,000 was in our auditing report said buildings and grounds expended more than budgeted. Andrew, Christina, and I had a good conversation about that because it was pre all three of us. <laughs> and we would, are going to make the, theor the assumption that it was because of soil testing at UES for the playground. It was right before the bond was taking place. A lot of soil testing had to happen that we didn't account for. And the best we can say is that that probably was the increase in the, in the or the decrease in the fund balance that year. The best we can tell. Um, in FY, and I don't remember. Huh? And I don't remember. You don't remember. Yeah, I asked Jim too. He didn't remember. FY19, um, we had over $2 million. So we had a significant increase to our fund balance. In FY19, what happened according to our auditing report is that we had lower health care costs than budgeted. When we budget for healthcare costs for new employees, say, we always budget for a family healthcare plan. Sometimes we hire where it's a single healthcare plan or the person doesn't take healthcare. That's a savings of approximately $20,000 when that happens. So you have three or four people who do that, which is possible, um, and you get significant, you get significant health savings in what we've budgeted for healthcare costs. At that point, we had merged with Roxbury, Montpelier had merged with Roxbury. We had expected that in the beginning of the merger, Roxbury students could, were going, they had school choice in high school. And so part of the merger agreement was an agreement that the students who were in their present high school did not have to come to Montpelier High School, that we would pay their tuition. Um, and they'd kind of be grandfathered in that way. And so that year we had less Roxbury students tuition to other districts. And my memory serves me correctly, a lot of that had to do that with if a Roxbury student was going to Northfield and decided to go to the tech center, that's they could do that under our realm too, right? So it, they go to the same tech center. So it wouldn't be a tuitioned experience for that student, that it, rather it'd be one of our students who went to a tech school. Does that make sense? So um, that's one of the reasons why there were less Roxbury students who were tuition. We had to pay the tuition for other schools. And then special education costs came in lower than expected. There can be lots of reasons for that. We build our plan for our special education costs for the budget in October the year before. So when we do that, we're making assumptions based on the service plans that we have in October the year before. Those service plans could change. Kids can move. We could get... Um, kids could learn a lot of skills in one school year, you know, and may not need that one-to-one -one aid anymore. So there's a lot of differences a year makes, and we do the best we can with our service plans the year before the budgeting process. So um, special education costs came in much lower that year. In FY20, that was the year that we closed, COVID closure, and our fund balance grew during that fiscal year from to $2,975,000. Special education staffing needs came in much lower than expected. We had lower healthcare costs than budgeted. 
Uh, we had less Roxbury and private pre-K students tuition to other districts and programs. Remember, we pay tuition for pre-K students who go to private pre-Ks. And when schools closed, parents didn't send their kids to pre-K. And so when you have 20 kids, you know, that equals up to a lot of money. Um, la uh, transportation was obviously significantly less than budgeted because we weren't using our buses when we closed in March. Um, after March, we had no substitutes. We had no custodial overtime. Literally, the only people in the building was myself, Jim Birmingham, Angela Rosa, and the principal who was also helping us serve lunch, and one custodian. That was it. And they were only in this building. We were in no other buildings during that closure time. So therefore, our electricity bill was significantly less. Um, so, and then we had savings from new hires. When, when a person re retires, obviously at the end of the pay scale, and we hire somebody at the, the beginning of the pay scale, that's a significant cost savings. And then in FY 22 or 21, remember it was the year of potting and a virtual instruction. So approximately a third, a quarter to a third of our student body was in virtual instruction, not on campus. The rest of our kids were potted K-8, and here at the high school, they were here for a significantly different schedule than what they were used to. Um, and so that year, our fund balance did grow significantly to $3,783-ish. We had a savings from new hires. Um, our professional development, what we budgeted for professional development that year was essentially not used. So every teacher, every professional in our district, including our administrators, have the, U, the equivalent of six credits at UVM. The monetary equivalent is six credits at UVM, which equals what, about 6,000, Christina? 3,000? So when we have 200 people not using that money, that's a significant savings. Um, transportation was significantly less than budgeted because there was a lack of field trips, there was a lack of co-curriculars, sports didn't start up until later on in the year and they were not necessarily going to all the events that they typically go to. We didn't use substitutes that year, literally, everybody remembers, only board members were allowed to clean, our, clean the buildings at UES into the buildings, no other person was allowed into our buildings unless you worked here or went to school here, and we had no custodial overtime. Several positions that year were not filled. Custodians, our board members know. <laughs> um, so when you have a full year of non-filled positions, that's a significant budget um, savings. Also in our instructional assistance class um, situation, we had a lot of openings. We also, in the beginning of FY21, offered the board offered an early retirement buyout, for, and four teachers took us up on that early retirement. We didn't fill those positions. So those were four teachers at the end of the salary scale that we didn't, have, we didn't have to pay for the entire year because of the buyout. So those are the reasons why our fund balance got to be the size that it got. Um, they're all very legitimate reasons, most of which are out of our control because of the situation that we found ourselves in. Any questions from the board about that piece? Um, okay, so how does the district determine how to spend fund balance? This is in the fiscal management policy. I just cut and pasted it squarely from there. There is some question, Mia asked a good question around the number three, the committed piece. And Amanda, if you keep going. As approved by voters, when the voters vote on articles in town meeting, one of the articles every single year is this one. Um, and this is talking to that committed funds. So essentially the voters, when they vote yes on this, they're voting to say that the school board has the, the ability and responsibility to decide how to spend fund balance dollars. Um, keep, and the legal references are down on that slide for anybody who's interested in that. Go ahead, Amanda. Um, so what have we recently used the fund balance for? COVID PPE, it was beautiful. When we had that situation where it was just us, we knew what was coming down the pike. We were being told that we were gonna have to take the temperature of every child who walked through our doors. I didn't hesitate when I said, go buy me a thousand thermometers now and get good ones, right? And we didn't have to hesitate on that kind of thing. Um, we were able to find mass ventilation in ways that other school districts were not able to find because I said, I don't care what it costs, get them for our staff and faculty. And our people responded and did. Andrew LaRosa did an amazing job at making sure our ventilation systems were up to date. Tom, Tom Allen was on every single piece that we asked him to do, who's our head custodian. 
um, and our custodial supervisor. So we were able to do these things because of our fund balance. Uh, RVS heat pumps, three are in place. Three more will go in soon, and we have plans for four more after that. That was some discussion at the, at the finance committee, three more. <laughs> um, so RVS heat pumps are coming out of the fund balance, which the board approved that cost. Uh, we have an out, a confidential outside placement for a special education piece that happened before our time here, my time here, that we're, that's in the final year of finishing now. We have res, the board has reserved money for a net zero study, which I understand the facilities uh, committee discussed maybe today or is in discussion around right now what we're going to do with that. Uh, we have a revenue source in our local budget. So we use our, our fund balance to offset um, the decreasing merger incentives that we had received with the Roxbury merger because that we got a big merger incentive but it decreased each year and so that kind of is like a tax increase when that incentive decreased. We used our fund balance to offset that. We also have fund balance planned going forward as a revenue source in our local budget should we need it. Now, if we come into a local budget, and Christina's done a really nice job at helping me understand this, if we go and have our local budget set and we have planned, say, $300,000 as a revenue source in our local budget and we spend less than what we planned to, we don't use that $300,000. It goes into the fund balance. It goes back into the fund balance. We just don't use it. Um, and so that's happened, what we saw twice maybe, in the last five or six years that we were looking at. Um, and we've done increases to salary lines, particularly our food service, at unplanned times, um, particularly in the last couple of years. So we've used fund balance to be able to do that piece. Um, and I think that's... Can you? Oh, I can't move it. Sorry, I'm like, that's not I it. I didn't understand the tax piece around, like, the local budget. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that to me? Yeah, so we have used in the past of the fund balance as a revenue source in our budget to decrease the tax impact on our taxpayers. Um, are you talking specifically about the yeah, merger okay. piece? So yeah, not that one. So we could. So you use that money to say, okay, here's our local budget, um, and instead of. One million is going to be seven hundred thousand that you're voting for because we're using three hundred out of the fund balance. Yes, which means that the tax base is is only getting taxed on the seven hundred. Right. We did that in last year's budget. We've right. done it in every budget since I've been here. Okay. Yeah. Amanda, you can keep going. So, what's in the fund balance now? The finance committee just had a. Um, a presentation about this. It's directly out of the first quarter report. Our auditor has been in our offices for the past several weeks, where, and Christina asked her to look at this specifically for the board. So this is from the auditor. It's, while it's not a hard number, it's as close to a hard number as it possibly can be right now without having the audit report in our hands. Um, unaudited fund balance is 3,894,311. The assigned fund balance, so things we're already, we've looked at, so assigned is for the budget revenue, what I was just talking about, mm -hmm. um, is 700,000 for this year's budget that we're in currently and through 26, FY26. We've assigned that, so we're already planning on putting some of this fund balance towards our local budget to decrease that tax base, what we were just talking about, Amanda. Um, the board has committed 1.5 million for the track, so we're decreasing that from the 3.8. And then the unreserved set-asides for the outside placement, the net zero, the heat pumps, that kind of thing, that equals 105. So we want to de we want to subtract those three numbers, seven, 1.5, 100. And the current unreserved fund balance, that means there is no attachment to it, is 1,593,811. Our policy dictates that we want to have our rainy day fund should be 2% of our overall budget. Right now we're at 5.86% of our overall budget. And so with the additional 400 that the board could or could not be voting on tonight, <laughs> that would leave 1,049,834 and it's still over the 2% limit. 
Okay, Anikit did some good math today. I'm totally putting him on the spot right here. Um, but he figured out what the 2% was. It wasn't on the slide, it should have been. Anikit, do you remember that? $550,000 is the 2%. Okay, so we're, we're way over the, the board policy um, for the 2%. Amanda, you can keep going. Sorry to make you do that. So future infrastructure needs, Andrew put together the facilities report. It's linked here, it's on our webpage. Under facilities, it's on the board page, it's also here. Um, and I sat Andrew down and I said, okay, look at these projects that we presented last week and tell me when, tell me when you're thinking. Um, and so he said, about when, because we're talking, we're not, we're not sure, right? So about when, projects already planned for with local capital and grant fundings are happening in the next four years. Um, nice to have, like, hey, if you were thinking about something, relocate the central and business offices to some other space, renting in, in town perhaps, so that we can increase the capacity for academic spaces here at MHS. Jason, put your arm down. <laughs> um, in five to 10 years, uh, needed projects are gonna be the fire alarm panels, the elevator machine room upgrade here at MHS, flooring at MHS, potentially PCBs that's testing dependent, and the Main Street Middle School where they're not adding on a roof, but where the addition was, that's worded strangely, where the addition was put in in the 80s and new roof there. Um, keep in mind, in five to ten years, the capital plan does not have an assigned cost to it, right? At that point in time, if we go by our plan, the windows will be done. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing for something there. So you, the capital plan will be available for any needed projects then. And ones that we haven't thought about because it's five to ten years down the road. Um, nice to have projects at more athletic facilities upgrades. The MHS gym could use a facelift. Um, storage for outside, a con the concession stand, water, dugouts, more athletic kind of pieces um, for our students. 11 plus years, then we're talking about maybe the roof, but that's like a lot of, like 20 years down the road, Andrew said last week, 15 to 20 years um, for potentially here at the MHS, at MHS, and that's a long time to think of nice to have projects, so I'm not, <laughs> I didn't even kind of go there um, as to what might be nice to have in 11 plus years. Andrea, the, the roof, the 11 years is, you explained this last time, it's, the, it's to take this one all out and put a new one, right? And the, what you have, do you have something like that in the, Five to ten years, or not? Like to fix some of these, or no? no what, the, the, what we did a couple of years ago during the bond project is a is a perfectly viable, reasonable solution. Is it a brand new roof? No. So it's probably got a shorter window than than a normal than a regular brand new roof, but it's not deteriorating. It's not falling apart. It's it's viable, but we will want to replace it probably in the next two years, just to get it off the plate. If we have the ability to do it, we get it off the plate, and that's one more thing we don't have to worry about. Like I say, Main Street, and like as Libby was saying, Main Street and Union, most of those roofs are, are new as it is five, six years ago. So those, those have a good long life still ahead of them. So why a track? Um, I feel like, I don't know, go back. Picture speaks a thousand words there, go ahead. Um, this is what our current track looks like as of last week. Um, and the picture in the up left, it's, you can't tell where the track starts and the wooded piece ends um, for the, all the pine needles that are on it. I try to take a walk often when it's nice out in the afternoon and that is not just that day for the fall because pine needles have fallen. That is how it is all the time, including during track season. Um, you can see the tire marks that people have driven on uh, that is also common. It's also used as a parking lot for the community of Montpelier during bigger events. Can I clarify that? It used to be before, before yes, I answered that, that. That is from the soil testing. That is from the drill rig from the soil testing. But so your point, you're, we still, we're the only ones that drive on the track. Yeah. Now, with Andrew now, there. Yes. Um, the building is a, our beautiful concession stand that, um, is I'm being a little facetious and sarcastic when I say the word beautiful. Uh, we don't use it currently, it's, it's just not used. Matt, is it ever used right now? Um, recently, yes, I've restarted being used. You, used, you started it just recently. 
I've been in there. It's a little sketchy. <laughs> <laughs> we used it. <laughs> Um, the bottom left is a picture of what our current facility, our outdoor storage is for, Matt, are those your storage units for athletics under there on the bleachers? Matt is our athletic director. Those are recent. Those are prior, prior to a year ago, we had nothing that we could even contain things in. So those are, those are containers that we bought during COVID that were, we've moved over here and put under the bleachers. The idea being we can lock a baseball program up or a lacrosse program, but they are a temporary solution that's probably well past their yeah. sell-by date. Yeah. Um, so right and now there's no storage other than this. There's the garage. There's the room. Matt has one room here at MHS. We can do well. <laughs> <laughs> we can debate that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's not a place where you could put big equipment because it's upstairs and it's not accessible. Um, and then there's just a d another picture of the dirt. Um, so why, that's okay, keep going. So why a track? I'm going to ask Jason to help me out here as well. Um, Jason Gingold, who of course is our principal at MHS. Um, I'll start just by saying I've been here now for five years. The MHS campus is used by our entire community 360 days a year. A new track will add another aspect for that community benefit. I arrive at school at 6.30 in the morning and there are people on our campus using our facilities at that time, even in the dark. Um, it's used until I leave at night, which is typically between 5 and 6.30, so it's still being used uh, by not just our athletes, but by our community um, all the time, every day. Uh, the, this project will have no impact on taxes zero impact on taxes. It is money that is in the savings account. It will not increase the taxes in any way, shape, or form. And should the board decide to move forward with the, with the 400 in addition tonight, we will still be significantly over the 2% threshold for the fund balance that is written in, possibly, or in, in uh, policy. Sorry. Our mon that money is available now. You, we can get started. Um, we have gotten started on some, on some project things. We can do that. And all of our other infrastructure needs that, that our incredible facilities manager and administrative staff over the last few years, we've, it's been accounted for in all the other things that we spoke about earlier. Um, could we do perhaps some more innovative things? Maybe. Um, if we put our brains together, we'd have to really think about what that means. It also means staffing. It also means, so, like, when you make some decisions that are completely different in programs, it means a lot of other things as well. So we need time for that. Um, I'm gonna, the kids have done such a great job at talking about how it's a low-cost uh, sport for families, and it's fostering community and team, which our pre presentation earlier one significant thing that we have is community loss and anything we can do to increase community is a positive thing for our kids. Um, it also builds lifelong mentalities. I did skip a bullet because I want Jason to talk about that more. Um, I think quality facilities really demonstrates what Jim spoke about earlier to our community and our students that they matter and that future students that we care and invest in our schools. Um, and we have a laser-like focus on learning and social-emotional learning. We do, um, and we're learning a lot, and we have a lot of room to grow there, and we have systems in place. We have human resources in place right now that we haven't had before, and we're moving in the right direction as evidenced by the data that the board was presented with tonight. And I'll let Jason finish this up here um, with the research that is quite clear on what co-curriculars do for, for kids. Hi, everybody. Jason. Um, let's see. So some of this we've heard, but let's echo some of these thoughts. Students who engage in extracurricular activities graduate at a higher rate, um, decrease in incarceration rates, build structures for mental health support, decrease addition, addiction, as Jim spoke to earlier, promote leadership and community. And I think Noah way back there, I know, spoke of that earlier tonight. Uh, in the school year 21-22, Montpelier High School served 125 students in the spring outside on that track field. 87 in the winter. Um, and this fall, we have 155 students using that area. And that's just the high school, not to mention Nathan's program in the middle school. 
replacing the track as we're learning about is a potential one-time cost, right? There might be summer maintenance fees, but comparably it's a one-time cost compared to, we heard a lot about um, from Peggy Sue and Jess today about social emotional learning and increasing our staff. But it, as we know, every time we increase our staff, that also has a budget effect and could also increase the budget in years to come, which then could also have a riffing effect or a uh, budget challenge effect, right? So maybe a one-time cost now to increase social emotional wellness versus a staffing increase, which may not be manageable later. Um, we also know that there is a hiring shortage that you heard about not only here in the district, but also in the state of Vermont. I happened to take a quick look at School Spring, and there are 31 open therapist positions in schools across the state, and over 50 IA positions um, open across the state. And I, I didn't look at special educators, sorry. So overall, uh, the track can help alleviate some of those concerns and would just benefit our whole community, not just the high school community as well. Thank you. Questions for Jason or Libby? Or any Mostly, of us. Yeah, Andrew, any of us. Christina. Andrew? Mia? Andrew, I, I asked these during the, <laughs> thanks for still being here. Um, and thank you very much for that presentation. That was um, very helpful. And once again, just underscores what, um, how great, the great hands that our district is in. Um, I asked these during the facilities committee and I wanted to just ask them again tonight for the benefit of everybody else who's here. The numbers that we saw about a month ago, the construction cost is 1.4 alone. Um, can you break down what goes into that construction cost a little bit more for us? Yeah, it was a comprehensive cost estimate that took into account the stripping of the, of the, stripping of the track and soils and storing it and stormwater um, mitigations you have to do during construction. Um, the sub base, it was a full, it was a full cost estimate as well as including in there, Matt helped me out with some information on equipment for the track, and there was a question about that. Does this include the mats and the hurdles and things like that? We put that number in there. Um, it also includes a 10% contingency, design contingency. Uh, there's also fees in there for the uh, engineer, as well as permitting and uh, any sort of uh, permitting costs. The, the, the cost of the engineers preparing permits and then permitting costs that we would have on top of that. And then if the board were to vote yes, what's the process from there? And at what point, other points would the board and then by that and also the community have a chance to be engaged in the process? At this point, what we would do is if there was a go ahead today, I would, I would contact our engineers and tell them that we've got to go. We would redefine the scope because we talked about lights and concessions and things like that. So we'd redefine the scope a little bit with them to work out the fee. They would get working on a design, bring it to a schematic design level that would sit down with Matt Link, the athletic director, as well as anyone he, he thinks that would be worth bringing in to talk about you know, what event's going to go where and what are we going to do, and we would flesh that plan out. We would then bring it, at, would let the engineers work on that again. We'd bring it to the next higher level. We would present it to the board just so everybody can nod their heads and say, yep, we, we understand what you're doing. We would probably then uh, get that drawing cost estimated so that we knew before going into bidding whether we were on track or not. Uh, depending on what happened with that cost estimate, we would make some decisions. Um, they would be, <laughs> as this is going along, they would be working with the state agencies with regarding to permitting. And uh, early on, they would send it over there to get a little initial, initial conversation going, making sure there's no red flags. We would shoot to probably uh, try to go out to bid. The bid environment's a little different right now. We won't waste any, too much time talking about that, but it's a little bit different, but we would shoot for, I would hope, sort of a March uh, bid, you know, put it out to bid in some time in March. And having not talked too much with Matt Link about this, but I think construction-wise, we would wait until school got out, just because we can't really have trucks and, and the parking going on. They would build the road essentially, doing as little, uh, um, touching as little of the actual field as possible. You know, we'd have to do a little grading around it, but 
getting the construction done before the start of school so that soccer season would not be uh, interfered with. The track would basically, the road would cure over the winter because they need 30 days between paving and putting on the, the coating, the track surface. Um, and then we would work with, um, with regards to this, the laying on of the surface. That really we, we would have to, that would be dependent on weather and where we are with regards to, you know, how, much, how, much, how long does it have to set up before someone can walk across it? You know, do we try to sneak it in so we can get one event in the school year? Or do we just say, all right, we'll just, we'll work with what we got, and then we will we'll pay, we'll do the surfacing in the summer year, during the summer, when we don't have to worry about the lacrosse team running across it or anything like that while it's still green. So it's going to be, it will, I, I, I think you will learn from U32. U32 had a vision of when they redid their tract of getting it and they ran out of summer. And that's why they had to redo it in this, or they had to do it in the spring, do their actually coding in the spring, if I understand that story correctly. So that's the general layout of it. And then going after bid part is when we would put out the RFP that the board would approve mm. and the community would see. Is that no, what that happens? No, it would be. It would be a bid package. It would be a set of drawings and a set of specifications. We would, on a project this size, we would pre-qualify bidders. I would, I would work with, I would put out a, um, a pre-qualification statement that says, we're, we're going to be having this project, and if you want to be considered for it, show past projects so that you're bondable, all those sorts of things. From there, we would say, these companies can do it. We're comfortable. We're, if they win the bid, we will be happy to work with them. These other ones, they're not bondable, they haven't done something similar, they've never worked on a school project, they've never done a track, maybe we don't want to work with them. We'll have, we'll have that definition of who's we're going to allow work on if, as part of that pre-qualification process. So we'll have a group of pre-qualified bidders come March, and this is all tentative, um, because it used to be you wanted to be the first one on people's construction list you know you right after the new year you want to get your be the first project people say okay i got my summer work lined up road construction stuff like this no one's going to bid six months out no just no one's going to commit to the costs with the economy now in three months is that going to change i don't think in three months that's going to change much i think just think i would anecdotally a, a ef wall was bidding on a project at uvm they got a one day guarantee on their stainless steel for their headers so the supplier said, this, this quote is good for one day. It's not like that anymore. That was height of COVID. But we're still, it used to be 30 days or 60 days. It's, it's much shorter now. Information to be said, you use the word bondable. What does that mean? Because you're not means, talking about going out and getting a bond. No, that, that means that we, and we don't have to, we can request it. We will pay for it. But basically we say to a contractor, we're going to award this contract. You will give us a bond that says, I've got, this is a million dollar project. If for some reason I don't start, I don't complete, I don't do whatever, there's a million dollars. It's an insurance policy. It's an agreement. It's, a, it's, it's, an insurance. it's an insurance policy. Generally, if you've pre-qualified, you look at these, you, you know who they are, you know they can go, because if they are bondable, that means there's a company that says, yeah, you're not going to go out of business, you're not going to default on this project. So almost the fact that you can get a bond is almost as good as getting a bond. And again, we'll pay for it. If we want a bond, we'll pay a percent and a half of the project cost to get it. So that was very helpful. What I was trying to figure out was where the other points in the process moving forward, the board and the community would be engaged in the process. Well, again, I think that, that really if we, we know what it is. We know what the, it's a track project. Now it's really working with the athletic director and the facilities people to see what that looks like. Typically, there's not, the community has entrusted you to, um, to represent them, right? And so you're, we've hired an engineering firm. You know, we're, we don't want your input on where the hurdles are going to be stored. You know, we, but we do want to, we will present you when we get a plan that we're all pretty comfortable with and Matt Link is comfortable with, we will show it to you. So if someone says, hey, where are they storing the hurdles? You can say, I saw that and they're going to store them in this shed. And they say, how many? You say, I don't know how many, but I've been, I've been assured that there's going to be an appropriate amount of storage for those sorts of things. So I think 
just as a matter of course, we would show you the plans as you'd like to see it. It's a big project, we'd like to see it. But feedback and interest, I think that would be relatively, relatively minimal. I think that's what the building and, and we would certainly present to the building and, and energy group a little more often just so to say, this is where we're at, keep you an update. And again, that, would, that sort of seems like the role of, of that committee. So is that where the adaptability conversation is when you get the bits? We will go through, again, we will go through and questions like that, we will, we will reach out. We're not gonna do this behind closed doors, but we're not gonna do it here, <laughs> you know, so. If there is questions about that, things people would like to see, uh, my, feel free to contact me and we we'll talk about those things. So in terms of that equity piece of it around like the having it adaptability be included in that conversation, I, like is that, I'm just trying to make sure that happens. I think that we, we can't build something like that is not, we're not allowed to part do of, that. Part of that line yeah. item is a paved ADA sidewalk from the parking lot to the track and the concession and, and, and the bleachers. Well, it's not about access, but adaptability to students with disabilities who are in a wheelchair, who are amputees, who are, yeah. Yeah. who have different texture around the way the tracks are built. I was doing a little research about that. Like, so I please I share any, any thoughts you have. Okay. And just to be clear, like, we do not have an accessible track now. Like that, that is not accessible or safe for a student with any, or a person with any kind of physical disability. I, I have some overall questions from both. So, The question around the tax benefit, you know, just, just want to go back because we're saying it's not a tax increase, but we could choose that we're going to put this in the general budget. We could choose. I'm just, I just want to make sure that we are clear. That is a choice, too, that we could say people are hurting because people are hurting. And as you want people to come, people are leaving because they can't afford our towns. Um, so just like that is another like thought, right? Like we could say, hey, we're gonna put one point two million as part of the general budget, which is gonna decrease taxes. So it's not it doesn't have a tax benefit, just for transparency purposes. That's not what I'm offering, but I just want to be clear that that is what I'm understanding. That we could take this money and put it as it as part of the general budget that is coming. To create up. a savings, but. But the cost of the track will not cost taxpayers money. Yeah. I mean, exactly. I, mean, could, I just so want to be clear and transparent with that. Yeah. We, could, with we could also tear down our budget for a exactly. tax benefit as well. Mm -hmm. And I think those are my questions. Oh, the, the other one is around the hiring shortages and the thought of that we could use this money to grow our own, right? Like there is some school districts thinking about growing our own paras, grow, growing our own, you know, paras to become special educators or teachers and putting some funds around that idea that yes, we don't have staff and we have some interventions that we could see myself. Uh, <laughs> um, that you know we could grow our own program and grow our own initiatives that are about teaching and that could be also part of that so that just brings me to that conversation around like the different purposes we could do that so that was like just that comment that i had around thinking of teaching shortages and also thinking about our assets that we have here in our district It's not really a question, I guess. But that conversation did come up in the Finance Committee, and the structures are already here to build paras and IAs. Um, and it's happened, and it can, and it, this, the, the, there, are, there are already structures to do that. I don't think it needs $2 million to do that at all. 
Wow. Why not? But yes. Continue to have conversations after tonight, whether we vote on it or not. I mean, <coughs> from the perspective of uh, of Roxbury, I I think it's hard for kids to. It's 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 a challenge to bit, make and build and sustain friendships once kids get to MSMS. <coughs> um, you know, working on connecting the elementary schools early and often is something that I think we're all thinking about. I'm certainly working on that. Pen pals between families, whatever we can do to build relationships. A, a large track program is a, would be a huge benefit to Roxbury kids to stay after school and, and be with their friends and be part of the program to take advantage of the late bus that we have. Um, and there's a, well, I've heard nothing but support from Roxbury. I mean, what we see from the presentation, our academics are doing pretty well. What we're missing is community and social emotional loss. All of this stuff is about social emotional, um, social emotional community. I have Avery telling me that, or all of us, that um, you know, he found a group of boys that make him a better human being every day. That's like, I'm like, I was having a hard time listening to that. That was really powerful. You know, another kid saying that they, they transferred here to be part of the track team because of the community that that track team has established. I mean, when you talk about com community, we talked about how loud the cheers were for the soccer team out there. It's not just the players and the athletes, it's the friends that come and support them, that get together for events to support their, their friends. And, their, and, and that's where community gets built. That's what, that's what being in middle school and being in high school is all about. I mean, it's not necessarily that you're the star, it's that you can cheer for, you know, you and your crew can, can cheer for whoever it is that's the star. Um, I don't know. I just, I just think this is so, the benefits of this is so great, and the damage that could be done if we prolong this process, it could ruin it. I think we 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 walk into a very very sort of dangerous place if we prolong this process further. Um, I'd like to, to make a motion to have a vote. Uh. If I can, I don't know. Should if that's we? You definitely. I, I mean, felt like there was sort of another motion that had been made, but just not formally. And I just want to make sure that Mia, if you want to proceed with that motion, okay. Thank you. I think what you will need to do is actually make yeah. a motion to. Uh, can I? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to to commit the additional four hundred thousand dollars so that the process can begin. Um, did I just do it? <laughs> okay. I'll second that. Discussion? Well, I'm gonna say that I would have liked to hear from Libby and all of them about specifically more priorities of how you would use this like um, and give us a chance to think through the holistic picture around all the pieces uh, I think again like I uh, reread the infrastructure report um, I reread some of the recommendations that Andrew has in that report including I am you know Today, today I come with disability in mind for a lot of reasons, but I'm thinking a lot about accessibility and people in wheelchairs, and that's what I'm bringing in to, today with me, so bear with me, that I really just want to make this good when I make this decision seven years from now, who's coming to be everywhere in our school system, so like, Thinking of, uh, of Braxbury and rereading the piece around having a wheelchair access for people in the town hall uh, and for people who are having community events there. And just rereading that, I was like, oh, we should really prioritize having an accessibility piece around the Roxbury town hall where community events happen. And that it, and so I would have loved for this process to be conversations around the actuality 
versus this binary. You are for the track or not. And um, that is sad. It's sad to me that that is what happened, right? Like that it was a binary between am I voting for the track or am I not? So that is the discussion <laughs> I am having right now. For people in wheelchairs in the town hall, just not directly through the front door. It they is accessible. Through the ceremonial front door. Through, through the, the historic ceremony. Which front does door. not get open often. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want, I want to say, I mean, I, I definitely acknowledge that this process could have been far better. And I think it should have been far better. I think we should learn from it. I also feel that the strong consensus on the board is that this is a project that we're going to approve and I think further process is likely to confuse it and also put up I think a false choice. I also do not think this is a binary choice. I think that a lot of the priorities that have been spoken to tonight and spoke to the community are things that we are working on and we want to work on and we want to continue to have those conversations. This is not the track or all these other things that Amanda and Mia and Emma and everyone else here has brought in as, as priorities and you know Kristen and you know the needs in Roxbury that that you know Red has talked about these are all continuing conversations we can have and things that we need to continue to work on and things that can be funded from other sources and things that as Libby has stated are being addressed and thought of now this is not a binary choice and I think that has been kind of falsely teed up in the community and I really feel that that is one of the things we need to do and and, and while we may not have, okay, yeah, this is, yeah, we're always a constant process. I think we definitely need to educate the community on, you know, if the board does vote affirmatively as to why we did it and why this makes sense and why those other priorities are continuing to get our attention or continue to be things that we care about and things that we have, you know, resources and, and we'll have continuing resources to fund because, you know, a school is an organic system. We keep fixing things, we keep making it better, we keep making investments, we keep doing things for our kids. Um, and I feel tonight is an opportunity to do one wonderful thing for our kids, a needed thing for our kids, I think a thing that needs to get done, um, but we need to do lots of other things too. And this is, this is, this is a step along the way. It's not the, not the end of anything. It's not taking anything off the table. Um, it's, it's a great thing we're doing and we're gonna continue to do great things. As the parliamentarian, I think if we have a motion that was seconded, we have to withdraw it. Otherwise, it's like an open question, right? I didn't really make you a didn't? motion. Okay. okay. I didn't really okay. make a motion. Okay. But okay. yeah. sure. well, thank you. <laughs> Keeping us in line. One type of yeah. Emma. Um, I mean, I, I think that we have a real opportunity. I'm excited to see that we have another million dollars in the fund balance, that we have an opportunity there to engage the community that is already now paying attention and engaged on this topic um, and we can bring them in for a for a really solid process moving forward that can be like a model of best practice of how we um, how we allocate fund balances in the future and and I think it's a, a good amount of money to um, address some of the major concerns that I heard in emails that haven't already been addressed with other funding sources. Because most of the things that I heard people in the community asking us to use the fund balances for instead of the track were things that were already being addressed. Um, but there were a couple of things that were really good uh, suggestions that now we have this other million dollars to create a process around. So one last thing because I forgot this, that I just want to thank everybody that did send your comments. I think 50%, it, it was very close. I got about 96, 97 folks that um, responded to a survey put up in Front Porch Forum. It's really 50-50. Some, some of the responders already have sent, had sent emails or were here present. Others were new. Um, and I, I feel like a lot of the concerns were around process, transparency, which is also one of the you know, top points in the visionary process that we did. Um, there was a lot of misinformation around the track field, so some of that around the, yeah, the, sur the turf. There was a lot of, you know, don't vote on it because of the turf. So I think that one thing we could do is um, that I am going to respond to the 97 people that emailed me in that survey about my decision in, in this meeting, but 
I think that it that we should learn from that process that to see from Porch Forum as a way to engage. Um, it's the only way I can engage because I'm not on Facebook or social media. <laughs> and I try to not be in email so much. So I think that it's important that we do not take for granted our elderly and that we don't take for granted um, those who don't have kids in our districts and that we do engage with them. And I think not necessarily so much for the process, we've had plenty of opportunities to we are the source of the information. And if we don't put that information outwards, somebody else will. And we need to be very clear, concise, and we need to all be on the same page about what that information is. Um, again, the danger of the single story piece. So I think there is still a lot of misinformation and it wouldn't hurt to do a public session about like, here's all the misinformation we hear, here's all of it in addition to this. People are busy, they don't have time to sit in school board meetings or listen to the videos for three hours and I don't expect them to. So, I won't say anything else. Please. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. This was a, quite a process. An imperfect one. Cut <laughs> along. Uh, uh, should we? Do we really should do the fourth quarter financial work. Um, yeah, first quarter. First, to, fourth quarter. Yeah, first quarter. Yeah, first quarter. First quarter financial report. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Christina. Well, Christina, take the hot seat. Yeah. We're gonna do the first quarter report. Thank you all for coming. And thank you so much yes. Everyone. Thank you, everyone. It's really helpful. Help. Yeah. No, we got it. Robert's not here. But you don't have to. Um, I will also be alarmed. Thank you. Doors and stuff like that. Right. Hopefully this will be quick. I'll check in with them. I'll, I'll see. I can set the alarm. It's fine. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Christina. I know. Hello. This has been... Good night. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Um, do I? Committee has kind of taken the lead of like finance. what were the or finance? Sorry, finance committee has taken the lead as to what were the highlights, and Christina's here to ask, answer any questions from the rest of the board who did not have the in-depth overview of the finance committee. Um, so I'm going to nominate Anikit to give some highlights. <laughs> oh, I second that nomination. <laughs> okay. Um, um, we, we had a good finance committee meeting. Um, a few highlights. We are, um, overall, we are, um, I don't know, over budget is the right word, but we are um, over our average spending for uh, the first quarter. Um, a, a few things that uh, were highlighted, um, uh, the we have five or four out of district placements, uh, unexpected high number of those, and that's uh, that's contributing to a, um, a major portion of it. Um, we have um, the the buildings and grounds. There's a there's a big concern about fuel costs. Um, is in general the cost of fuel is going up, so fifty to seventy thousand dollars over there. Uh, that may be over the budgeted amount. We have a couple of other things, which are um, the vacancies that Libby and others talked about. Um, so that may bring down, um, but you know we might fill them. Uh, but that's something that that uh, we'll continue to monitor as far as the budgets and spending is concerned. Um, the, we, we talked at length about the fund balance, or Libby did, about fund balance and how it's allocated, so I don't think we need to go into that um, again unless there are specific questions. 
Uh, as far as revenues, um, we have uh, pretty much everything on the as expected, and there's uh, there isn't anything that jumped out to me that was out of alignment uh, as far as the revenue sources are concerned. Um, no concerns or nothing that that out of ordinary for me. Um, a few highlights that are usual: uh, the the food service information. Uh, uh, we you know run, we want to run that as a business, but there are challenges in in doing that. Um, so we every year we we allocate one hundred ten thousand dollars or about one hundred thousand dollars that we will uh, transfer to to make up for the deficit. And we've done that this year as well. Um, the other funding sources, um, everything is just um, as per expectations. And same goes for long-term debt. Um, there's nothing really on that page that, that jumped out to me, uh, unless I'm missing something. No. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much it. What did I miss, Jill? Well, I, I think it just it reflects some of the same things we saw in the presentation from um, from about special education and, and social emotional learning, right? Like the out of placement is higher than expected and we would probably expect to see that. And then there's other places where the budget is also seeing sort of the impacts of that. So um, yeah, I think you covered it. And, and, and a lot of the expenditures are front loaded. A lot of the trainings and purchases and things do happen in the first quarter. So that can also account for it being a little higher this quarter. And we'll continue to calibrate and watch it as the quarters come by. Yeah, and there was a comment or, or question I had uh, that the, 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 I think Christina made that comment that, the, uh, as Jill mentioned, a lot of things in here are high because they're front loaded. But one of the comments I made was then the two year average, shouldn't that reflect if it's the front loaded, if it's a common thing that we're front loading it every year, shouldn't the two year average catch that? But the the reasoning behind that is last two years haven't been normal. They haven't been, you know, the, the, we were affected by COVID, and so a lot of things didn't get front-loaded because a lot of things didn't happen. So that's why the two-year average is a little skewed over there. In those out-of-district placements, there are a handful of, of kiddos that really, really had some serious behavioral challenges. And so it was sort of agreed upon with the families and the district that they would get better services in a different site. And part of Libby's response to that is investing in the Thrive space, correct? The Rise, Shine. Rise, thrive, yeah. Rise Shine, and Thrive. Because if we can create better spaces, which we're working on, then we'll be better able to serve kids that have more sort of Impactful behavioral, dis, you know, disturbing this behavioral disturbances, or I don't know how you how I want to say that, but kids that are struggling in in a way that disrupts everything around them, they'll have a they'll have better spaces to those be services. better space to provide those services in a in a way that maintains somebody's dignity. Yeah, and in my experience, if somebody's in crisis, the best thing to do is give them a safe space to to go through that process and not try to stop it, just allow it to happen in a safe way. Did I read or did I this up? A settlement agreement in there, in the financial report? Yeah, it's a confidential settlement agreement that's happened for the past four it's, years? Yeah, it's been there. Yeah, it's this been is the while. last year. Okay. Yeah. So that's not like a new lawsuit or anything? No. I'm sorry? It's not like a new lawsuit or anything? Oh, no, 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 no. no. It's the last year. We would year. know that, right? If it were a lawsuit? If there was a lawsuit, like settlements or no? Um, in a confidential manner, yeah. yes. So the, um, the, higher, the higher number of out-of-district placements for 504, that, is that that wedge of the pie we were seeing from yeah. Peggy Sue that's the not, not at MRPS? That's those. Mm -hmm. It could be. It, it could be. 
But it's not that that pie wouldn't, or that wedge wouldn't be just totally 504s necessarily okay. either. You know, the, in the exchange program, there's students who are on IEPs who yep. are in the exchange program with U32. Got it. Right, right. That's right. Okay. And there's kids with 504s who are in the the exchange program, and they're you know like so yep. it could be yes. Okay. And then I also noted the um, anticipation that fuel costs will be higher by a significant amount. Do we, is that the kind of thing that, you know, we have in the fund balance, we have that $400,000 sitting there ready to go as a transfer. Is that the kind of thing that we would use that for? We haven't put it as a set aside yet because we haven't locked into any contract, but Andrew, Andrew and I are meeting weekly to keep on top of this. So okay. once we know what we're gonna end up spending, um, it also comes down to, you know, springtime. Are our tanks empty? Can we get by? Do we need to fill them up, you know, mm -hmm. March, April? Mm -hmm. So it will actually be a third quarter decision to, to see what we end up spending. Okay. Sorry, I'm happy because I just take my oil and I was like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> I just filled my tank and it was yes. triple of that what I actually paid. Triple. Can I make an observation? I think that the part of the sort of feeling of the problem with the process that we had is that we're all so new. Because the more I see stuff, the more I remember how it connects to this and that, and this and, and, and all these things are very much connected, and it doesn't necessarily feel that way in the moment. And it's taking a lot of time to sort of think about how all these things string together. I, I, I don't think, I know that the process didn't, go as we might have hoped, but I think that we're doing a really good job. I, I mean, I hope that other people feel that way. Um, it's just, it's, it's, it's so much information, it's really hard to wrap my head around it, and, and I'm in it now for more than a year, and all the time, it's like, I'm spending this time, it's like, the, that, I saw that over there, but it looked different, because it wasn't presented in the same presentation, or under the same facility name, or committee name, or whatever, it's like, I don't know, I mean, it's hard to wrap your head around it, so it obviously, so it's always going to feel clunky and imperfect. Yeah, there's a lot of streams and tributaries coming together to kind of form the river that's this district, and it's, it's, it is complicated and confusing. I think mid December VSBA is offering a like reflective process workshop. Um, so it's worth checking out their website, but essentially kind of framing what a process would look like. Okay, this happened, it's now behind us, and now we have the opportunity to look in the rear view and really do some reflective thinking about how we can improve and refine process. So I feel like we did that, but we didn't do anything with it. We had two processes in front of us, which we dissected, and then we didn't do anything with it. So we need to be better at that, at doing something and continuing with it. Um. The facilities, or sorry, the finance report. <laughs> <laughs> <Yes>. Second. <laughs> Any discussion? Alison Bear. Aye. Aye. Um, I say we fund all of the readings to next time. We yeah, I feel comfortable with that. I would. I, mean, I don't think <laughs> anyone well, rightfully should have had any time to read through any of those with any fidelity. Yeah. So I'm gonna. I think that we should allow you time to do that. Um, question regarding the process for the first readings. Do we have to say it like in, in more advance or no? Do you, did you remember we had this and we're yeah, like, oh yeah, we're I'm supposed sure. to do that? Um, we were ta that was about the final warning of like when we're going to be voting on it, I think. Okay. Yeah, yeah adopting I think, it. Yeah, um, I think when you have first readings, you want to discuss it so people have the opportunity to say, yeah, I saw this, it didn't make sense, you explain yeah. that, so. And we've been working on those, that group of policies for a long time in the policy yeah. committee, so it would be great to like have some fresh eyes on it. Um, and then we're totally willing, it's on our next agenda to look at notes. It's, yeah. so. Thank you. If you have notes, let us Thank know. You, Christina. Thank you, Christina. Go home. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Wait, home, you're gonna, home? You're gonna, you're gonna do it, aren't you? Yes, yeah, yeah. thank you. Thank you. Do you have a second? Second. Ellis in favor? Aye. Aye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for putting in a lot of work on this.